Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. So, before we begin, I'd just like to quickly announce that, from now on, I'm going to be doing shorter weekly episodes instead of longer bi-weekly episodes. This allows me to push out more content and be more flexible with my episode creation. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Episode 3, Egypt Before the Pharaohs. Today, we're going to be discussing the early history of the land of Egypt and learning about the mysterious origins of one of the world's most ancient civilizations. As we discussed in our last episode, northern and eastern Africa have been populated by humans for about as long as modern Homo sapiens have existed. Hunter-gatherers migrated back and forth across the old Sahara grasslands, following herds of animals that they hunted. But, as the Sahara grew more arid every year, the savanna became sand, and the herds of animals gradually disappeared, meaning that the Saharan peoples would have to find a new place to live. Some of these people eventually came to settle in the Nile River Valley, where they encountered a few small groups of people on the verge of a world-altering breakthrough. So, now I get an opportunity to talk more about geography. Yes, I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it and just want me to get to history. This isn't called the Geography of Africa podcast after all, so I'll try to make it brief. Anyways, the modern nation of Egypt centers around the Nile River. But, if you look at a map of Egypt today, you'll notice that the country almost resembles a square in terms of its inland borders. There are vast stretches of desert to the east and west of the Nile, with the occasional oasis town or coastal city in between. Now, I want you to forget about all of that. Throughout every discussion of Egypt from now until the modern era, Egypt will refer to essentially just the Nile River and its banks. The ancient Egyptians called this land Kemet, meaning black land, referring to the region's dark, fertile soil. The desert was known as Deshret, or red land, and was largely seen as being a place of death and chaos, somewhere to be avoided and somewhere foreign. While sure, the ancient Egyptians did occasionally interact with and even integrate the people of these desert oases, for the most part, Egyptian civilization can be confined entirely to the Nile Valley. Egyptians grew their crops on the banks of the Nile, they built their cities and homes along the Nile, they washed their clothes in the Nile, and transported goods and people up and down the Nile. In a sense, the Nile River is an engine that powers Egyptian civilization. The Egyptians also understood their geography in terms of the Nile. In our culture today, we associate the direction of north with up. Most of our maps portray the northern hemisphere on top of the southern hemisphere. However, this concept would be entirely foreign to the ancient Egyptians. To the Egyptians, up in the geographical sense, meant up the Nile River. And remember that most of the water in the Nile originates to the south of Egypt, in the Ethiopian highlands. Therefore, when the Egyptians drew maps, they put the south on top. This is important, because throughout this episode, you'll hear me refer to large subsections of Egypt as upper and lower. Lower Egypt was in the north, around what we call the Nile Delta region. Today, this region is the center of most of Egypt's population, as it includes the nation's biggest cities, Cairo and Alexandria. However, in ancient times, Lower Egypt was far less populous than its southern counterpart. The most important urban centers of early Egyptian civilization existed in Upper Egypt, and as we'll come to see, this was usually the dominant region in early Egyptian history. As the Saharan peoples migrated into Egypt, they encountered a culture on the verge of a massive civilizational breakthrough. These prehistoric Egyptians practiced a transitional mode of subsistence. They had not yet perfected agriculture, and were still hunter-gatherers. They ate a diet that consisted mostly of wild grains and meats, but also relied heavily on the catching of fish from the Nile. However, what distinguishes these people from other hunter-gatherers is that they went to great lengths to ensure the cultivation of wild grains, which they would then gather later. The people of prehistoric Egypt grew to rely less and less on hunting and gathering to fuel their diets, and instead relied more on the regular grain harvest to sate their hunger. As their lifestyle became centered more around the grain, their lifestyles became gradually more sedentary or focused on one place. Rather than migrating from field to field, instead, small groups would just lay claim to one field and cultivate it regularly to maximize its output. This was still not a form of agriculture as we know it, as they did not cultivate the grain in organized rows or use any form of irrigation, but they were just on the precipice. 
The migrants from the Sahara were joined by another group of migrants, this one from the Middle East. Scholars had long believed that these Middle Eastern peoples were responsible for the introduction of true agriculture in Egypt, but I'm skeptical of this claim. Based on how close the prehistoric Egyptians were to true agriculture, I find it more likely that they developed it independently, and that these migrants instead only introduced new methods, rather than inventing the concept outright. These three groups, Saharans, prehistoric Egyptians, and migrants from the Middle East, formed a sort of ethnic melting pot that would eventually become the people of ancient Egypt. Now, these groups were likely quite different in a few ways, but there was one thing that we know for certain that they all practiced, and that was a strict adherence to egalitarianism. These Saharan, Egyptian, and Middle Eastern peoples were all hunter-gatherers, and among hunter-gatherers there is a pervasive commitment to equality among both the sexes and classes. Usually, there is little to no organized hierarchy, with leadership positions usually falling to any individual who takes initiative at that moment. Economically, most hunter-gatherer societies practice a gift economy, in which the resources are shared between members of a tribe or band, so that each member has enough resources to live. Obviously, there isn't perfect equality, but generally, these hunter-gatherer societies are far more egalitarian than even our modern industrialized societies, much less a Neolithic city-state. Around 6000 BC, there was an explosion of agricultural settlements throughout the Nile Valley. As the people of Neolithic Egypt became increasingly reliant on agriculture, they began to flock to larger settlements, exponentially increasing the population. However, this led to the emergence of a problem for these new societies. Agriculture, especially before the development of more advanced techniques, is incredibly fragile. During a good harvest, everyone in the settlement will be incredibly well fed, and more migrants will be attracted. However, not every year is a good harvest. Now, if you're a small familial group of hunter-gatherers, this wouldn't really be a problem. You've stored enough grain from previous harvests that you can just consume that instead until the harvests improve. But, as people consolidated into agricultural settlements, the amount of food necessary to feed the growing population exploded. This increased need for food could be satisfied during a good harvest, but only at the expense of the grain stores. There are two solutions to these problems. The first is the development of more advanced irrigation systems. Every year in May, a series of monsoons hit the Ethiopian highlands, resulting in a huge flood of water into the Nile River. Early on, Egyptians would simply plant their crops in the inundated land as the flood receded, but this limits the amount of land you can use, as well as the amount of time you can use it before the next flood comes and destroys your crops. In order to fix this problem, the Egyptians created a new system called basin irrigation. In this system, a small dam would be constructed to divert water from the river into a small basin of land, where it would inundate the land before being diverted back to the river. This system allowed for a much larger section of land to be arable, but also required an organized and coordinated workforce to finish such a complicated project. The ability to coordinate the construction of irrigation projects commands a huge amount of power, and anyone with the influence to do so was immediately the most powerful person in the settlement. The other solution to the problem of agricultural variance is agricultural consolidation. After all, if you control two fields and one has a bad harvest, you can just rely on the other until your second field starts to produce food again. However, this leads to a problem. What if the next field over is owned by another settlement, or by a tribe of hunter-gatherers? How come they get to have all that grain while we have regular famines? We have a much larger population, so why don't we just, you know take it. This era of pre-dynastic Egypt is when war as we know it is born. As these conflicts escalated in frequency and the need for irrigation grew steeper, it brought with it an increasingly strict hierarchy. Local tribal leaders could increasingly consolidate their power through their ability. Local tribal leaders could increasingly consolidate their power through the ability to organize a militia to conquer weaker settlements or build new irrigation projects. The old culture of these agricultural settlements, derived from the egalitarian nature of their hunter-gatherer ancestors, was abandoned in favor of a rigid hierarchy. These settlements evolved into small city-states, or as the Egyptians would eventually know them, gnomes, with nomarchs as the titles of their leaders. To further increase their power and legitimacy, nomarchs tie their identities to pre-existing spiritual beliefs. Their legitimacy no longer came from their ability to raise a large army and defend the grain yields, 
Nomarchs now derived their legitimacy from supernatural means. The emergence of this early form of religions had major effect on the role of women. While in hunter-gatherer societies, women are viewed as equal partners in labor. A notion emerged in the pre-dynastic period that associated women with spirituality and fertility. As a result, a rigid structure of gender roles emerged, with women being viewed as sacred objects of fertility. Statuettes constructed by the pre-dynastic Egyptians depict female idols as the primary object of religious worship, usually with especially large breasts and wide hip to highlight their association with fertility. So, as I'm sure you've noticed, the transition from hunting and gathering to agricultural societies wasn't necessarily a positive experience for the generations of people that lived through it. Hunter-gatherers transitioned from egalitarian societies to hierarchical societies, from superstitious to religious, from mostly peaceful to incredibly warlike. In addition to the societal transformations, the settled people physically transformed as well. Due to their reliance on grain fields, settled people had a less varied and less nutritious diet than hunter-gatherers, and were as a result shorter and less healthy. Life in an agricultural settlement was also more crowded, and therefore more disease-prone, than the migratory lifestyle. And finally, to top it all off, settled peoples worked longer and harder than hunter-gatherers to achieve these inferior living standards. So then, why did this change happen? If the hunter-gatherers live such superior lives than settled people, why did they choose to settle? Well, the answer to this puzzling question is complicated and controversial. If you ask 10 anthropologists about this problem, you'll get 11 answers. So, I'll just say my own personal theory. Just keep in mind that this is my own view, so don't take it as gospel. Personally, I see the adoption of agriculture as not an en masse decision to abandon hunting and gathering, but instead sort of a lifestyle trap. The adoption of a semi-sedentary lifestyle was initially beneficial, as it acted as a supplement to an otherwise normal hunter-gatherer lifestyle. However, the negative effects of such a lifestyle only became apparent after they became increasingly reliant on their grain fields, and by then it was too late. Once these hunter-gatherers were completely reliant on their grain, they couldn't return to their old ways. The initial population boom that occurred with the early adoption of grain had already increased their numbers beyond the ability to support themselves through hunting and gathering, Thus, they were stuck in the trap of agriculture, forced to forever chase an ever-growing crop yield to feed themselves. Regardless of your opinion on the cause of the adoption of agriculture, I think it's interesting to acknowledge the fact that, overall, the lives of individuals got worse as a result of this lifestyle change. I think it's important to be skeptical of narratives that human nature is inherently violent and selfish, as this was not accurate throughout the majority of our human existence. The systems of hierarchy and violence that we think of as being natural actually emerge with our reliance on grain and not from a built-in mechanism of our nature. By 4000 BC, the peoples of pre-dynastic Egypt were each part of three overarching cultures. Two of these existed in Lower Egypt, near the Delta region. The first to emerge was the El Omari culture. Very little is known about these people, besides that they lived in small settlements of dugout huts, and that the primary and that the family unit was the primary motive of when it... Very little is known about these people, besides that they lived in small settlements of dugout huts, and that the family unit was the primary mode of social organization. For agriculture, these people used tools made of threshed reeds and stone. Most lower Egyptian people belonged to a culture known as the Mahdi. Due to their close proximity to the Mediterranean, artifacts they created closely resembled those of ancient Syria and Palestine. Due to this similarity, we can tentatively assume that these people likely spoke a Semitic language and had a significant proportion of Middle Eastern ancestry. There is evidence of some forms of primitive metallurgy among the Mahdi people, including the creation of copper adzes and other tools. Mahdi grave sites are relatively bare, with few possessions being buried with the body. This implies that Mahdi nomarchs were relatively poor, and that Lower Egypt was divided between numerous city-states rather than a few dominant powers. Like the El Omaris, Mahdi buildings were mostly dugout huts constructed of reeds. However, some archaeologists have speculated that Mahdi and El Omari settlements were actually much larger than we thought, but the Delta region's propensity for devastating floods has destroyed the evidence for such constructions. In Upper Egypt is where we find the most important of Proto-Egyptian cultures, known as the Nakata. So, 
Why are the Nakata so important? Well, they form the cultural backbone of what would eventually become Egyptian civilization. Many of the things we culturally associate with ancient Egypt today, like their strong focus on the afterlife, an early form of hieroglyphics, and mud brick architecture, find their origin in the Nakata culture. The first ancient Egyptian style tombs also appear in the Nakata culture, and there's evidence that the Nakata buried certain animals in a funerary style. These careful burials imply that these animals held an incredibly important role in Nakata religious belief. They might also be the origin of two important aspects of ancient Egyptian religion, the presence of animal-headed deities and the veneration of cats. They also serve as evidence of an early origin for two important aspects of ancient Egyptian religion, the presence of animal-headed deities and the veneration of cats. By 3500 BC, the number of gnomes in Upper Egypt was decreasing rapidly as larger gnomes swallowed up smaller ones. Where once there were hundreds, now there were only a few dozen. Populations had dramatically consolidated, with settlements becoming major cities. Some of the largest cities during this period reached populations exceeding 5,000, which might not sound like much today, but was massive for the time. This period of political and social consolidation is known as the Second Nakata Period, and is when the first true states begin to appear in the Egyptian region. This period also shows a marked increase in the influence of the Near East on Egyptian culture. For example, the Jebel el Arak knife, an artifact from the ancient city of Abydos, shows a tremendous degree of Near Eastern influence in its stylistic carvings on the blade's handle. Pottery from this period also looks more similar to Middle Eastern styles than pottery from previous periods. For a long time, historians believed that the appearance of these Near Eastern motifs were due to an invasion or migration of people from the Near East into Egypt. However, there is no compelling evidence that such an invasion ever took place. It is more likely that Egyptians were introduced to these motifs by trade on the Mediterranean, rather than through conquest, as pottery in the Near East around this time also shows a significant increase in Egyptian influence. The next period of Egyptian history is known as the Third, or Final Nakata period. Lower Egypt was likely still ruled by dozens of small city-states, but, by 3200 BC, this consolidation had turned Upper Egypt into a sort of triumvirate, with only three city-states controlling the whole of the region. The first of these cities was the southernmost city of Nechen. Due to its far southern position, this city had little Middle Eastern influence compared to the cities further down the Nile. Rather, it derived much of its culture from the nearby Nubians, a people to the south of Egypt. Pottery from this period of the city include none of the markings of Near Eastern styles, but are very reminiscent of Nubian styles, for example. During this period, there was a gradual decline in the worship of female fertility gods. In their stead, each city worshipped a local protector deity. Nechen's guardian god was known as Nechani, or the Hawk. The city is also speculated to be the wealthiest of the three major cities in Upper Egypt, due to how the burial sites from this cities exceed all others from this time in terms of extravagance. The next city we'll discuss is called Nakata. This city is where the Nakata culture derives its name. So, in order to avoid confusion, I'll refer to this city by its alternative name, Nekaterian, for the remainder of the podcast. Nekaterian's name means Golden City, likely deriving from the city's nearby gold mines. Little else is known about the culture of this city, However, we are aware that Nekaterian's protector deity was a mythological creature, a slender desert predator with a forked tail and long, curved snout. The final city was the furthest downstream, Thinis. This city is even more mysterious than Nekaterian, to the point that its exact location is still unknown to this day. However, it can be assumed that this city was a capable military power, as early in its history it conquered a nearby larger city called Abydos. Thinis had likely conquered the city militarily. However, Abydos remained culturally and religiously supreme over Thinis. Abydos's protector deity, soon to be adopted by Thinis, was called Genti Amentu, or Lord of the Dead. Previous to now, all of the evidence we have regarding these cities comes from a combination of archaeology and speculation. However, finally, we've reached a point where we have written historical records to examine, albeit ones that are pretty lacking in substance. Our first historical record comes from the Um el Khab tomb near Abydos. This tomb contains a list of kings. Kings lists are an important resource in Egyptology that we'll see come up again and again throughout our explorations of ancient Egypt. 
Usually, they're a bit more substantive than just a literal list of kings. But in this case, the term king's list is not rhetorical. These rulers were likely nomarchs from Abydos and Thinis, and we're not sure what their real names were. Archaeologists instead just provide them with pseudonyms based on their early hieroglyphics used to mark their names, such as fish, stork, gazelle, or fingersnail. The order in which these powerful nomarchs ruled is unknown, and whether or not they even existed or not is a mystery. The first nomarch in which we have any confidence of the existence of is Scorpion I, King of Thinis. Scorpion is a mysterious figure, and almost everything we know about him is speculation. So, for what I'm going to say, just imagine that I'm saying probably at the start of the sentence. So, Scorpion was born around 3250 BC. He was also likely not born of royal blood, as early in his reign he had to fight a battle against a man named Bull, likely the previous ruler of Thinis, though he may have also been a nomarch of a rival city. Regardless, there is some evidence that Scorpion was a successful military commander, leading campaigns north into the Nile Delta and against the nearby city of Nekaterian. And that's pretty much all we know about his reign. I know, short biography, right? Well, despite what little we know about him, Scorpion's rule proved to be a major shift in Egyptian history, to the point where the end of his rule is used to end the Third Nakata period. So, what's so important about the end of Scorpion's rule? Well, this period concluded the era of relative power parity among Egyptian nomarchs. From now on, we are in the proto-dynastic period. Egypt was not yet unified by this point, but from now on, the Nile Valley would have one dominant city that was significantly more powerful than the rest. Egypt was not yet united by this point, but from now on, the Nile Valley would have one dominant city that ruled over the rest. The nomarchs of these cities were powerful, true, sometimes exerting rule over almost all of Egypt, but they weren't quite pharaohs as we know them. After Scorpion's death, very little is known about his successor, a man known as Double Falcon. The prevalence of his royal seal throughout the totality of Egypt, and even up into the Levant, indicate that Double Falcon may have actually briefly united Egypt under his rule. Double Falcon's royal seal appears most frequently in Lower Egypt, implying that this region might have been the base of his power. Maybe then, Double Falcon was not Scorpion's successor, but was rather the ruler of a rival city-state from Lower Egypt who extended his rule into Upper Egypt. Regardless, this burgeoning empire apparently collapsed quickly, as there is no evidence that Lower Egypt ever united under a new pharaoh after Double Falcon. The next Egyptian ruler we know, and the oldest person in history whose real name is known with relative certainty, is Irihor. Irihor ruled Nechen, and his rule extended all the way from Nechen in the south to the delta in the north. Little else is known about his rule, except that his reign would be the last time that Nechen held a dominant position in Egyptian politics. The next dominant pharaoh was named Ka, or as he's sometimes known, Pharaoh Arms. Ka was the last ruler of the proto-dynastic period, and, like Irihor, little is known about his reign. Ruling from the city of Thinis, he was able to extend the city's holdings throughout the Nile Valley. He was also the first he was also the first Egyptian ruler to use the serech. The serech was a type of royal symbol that would have been used by Egyptian pharaohs throughout the Old and Middle Kingdoms. This symbol consisted of an ovular shape, with a hawk perched on top, and the king's name written in the middle. So far, the nomarchs of these dominant states have come from multiple different cities. Scorpion and Ka from Thinis, Double Falcon from somewhere in Lower Egypt, and Eri Hor from Nechen. While some of these nomarchs came close to uniting Egypt, none of them have been able to sustain these realms beyond their deaths. Additionally, there is not yet any evidence that they were able to pass their rule onto their children, meaning that there is no indication of any dynasties forming around these rulers. However, one ruler from Thinis would come to supersede all other nomarchs in an unprecedented manner. He would unite Upper and Lower Egypt permanently, and crown himself Pharaoh. He went by many different names, including Menes and Scorpion II, but we'll be calling him by his royal name, Narmer. Tune in next week to hear how Narmer united Egypt and began Egyptian history as we know it. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by giving a monetary donation on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com, by giving the show a review on iTunes, 
or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. As I hinted at during the last episode, this week will focus on the life and times of Narmer, a powerful nomarch from Thinis, who would eventually become Egypt's first true pharaoh. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Before we begin, I'd like to announce that monetary support for the podcast will now be done through our Patreon page. If you sign up for just $1.99 per month, you'll receive a bonus episode each week that focuses on an interesting topic related to that week's episode. That's 50 cents, the price of a gumball, per premium episode. In order to keep our commitment to free education, these episodes will be purely bonus content and will not interfere with the main narrative of the podcast at all. Anyways, now that the podcasty stuff is out of the way, let's begin our dive into the unification of Egypt. Episode 4 birth of the first pharaohs. So, as we discussed last episode, Egypt had experienced a long trend of further centralization during the pre-dynastic era. Agricultural settlements coalesced and expanded into cities, and these cities became the bases of power of small states called gnomes. Local tribal leaders experienced an increase in power and fashioned themselves nomarchs. Some of these nomarchs conquered their rivals to increase their power base. By 3200 BC, Lower Egypt remained divided between many gnomes, but Upper Egypt had united under just three cities, Thinis, Nechen, and Nekaterian. Several powerful leaders from these cities had come to dominate the others, but none of these burgeoning states survived beyond the death of these powerful rulers. Narmer's story begins with his predecessor, a man named Scorpion II. Well, kind of his predecessor. He may have also been Narmer himself, just at a different stage of his career, but, well, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Scorpion II was most likely a ruler of Thinis, born not long before the unification of Egypt. The evidence for his existence comes mostly from an artifact called the Scorpion Macehead. This artifact features an illustration of a nomarch. He wears a tall crown atop his head, a symbol associated with rulers of Upper Egypt. On his left stand a pair of fan bearers, and on his right stands the symbol of a scorpion, from which his pseudonym is derived. He is also depicted with the tail of a bull, further increasing his noble status. Egyptians associated bulls with being animals of great prestige, and therefore pharaohs often wore bull tails on their belts. In his hands he holds a mattock. Based on this, we can infer that the mace head shows him directing an irrigation project. In the background, a series of plover birds hang upside down. In Egyptian art, plovers were used as an artistic depiction of the common peasantry. Most archaeologists interpret this as meaning that Scorpion had recently subdued the people of this land, and is using the irrigation project to establish his rule over this new domain. Some archaeologists have also connected Scorpion to a rock carving near the second cataract of the Nile. Cataracts are part of a river where the smooth flow of water is broken by a series of shallow rapids, making them nearly impossible to cross by boat. The Nile has six of these cataracts, and they would play an important role in shaping Egyptian history. The first cataract is located near the modern city of Aswan, slightly south of the ancient city of Nechen, and historically served as the default border between Nubia and Egypt. By default, I mean that in periods of relative parity between Egypt and Nubia, their borders would meet at this first cataract. The rest of the cataracts are located within Nubia, so they don't concern us for now. This rock carving at the second cataract depicts an enormous scorpion lording over a group of Nubian soldiers. Some speculate that this carving is meant to symbolically depict a victory of Scorpion II over a Nubian army. The location of this carving at the second cataract shows that Scorpion was able to penetrate pretty far into the lands of Nubia during this campaign. Scorpion, despite having a pretty long biography compared to other proto-dynastic Egyptian rulers, remains just as mysterious as the others in terms of his place in Egyptian history. Egyptologists mostly fall into three camps regarding who Scorpion was, 
One theory follows, essentially, the biography that I laid out for you earlier, and posits that Scorpion was a nomarch of Thinnis, who existed just before the life of Narmer. In this view, Scorpion's conquests were a precursor to the later conquests of Narmer, that Scorpion walked so that Narmer could run. Scorpion was the first Thinite nomarch to crown himself the pharaoh of Lower Egypt, and Narmer would carry on his legacy through the union of Upper and Lower Egypt. The second theory states that Scorpion was not a predecessor of Narmer, nor was he a ruler of Thinnis, but was instead a contemporary of Narmer's and the ruler of a rival city. So, the dating of artifacts in ancient Egypt is not incredibly precise. Usually, the time in which an artifact was created can be estimated to a range of about 200 years. This is pretty impressive when you consider how old these artifacts are. But, imagine if someone tried to tell you that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1976, or that World War II ended in 1745, give or take 200 years. This margin of error leaves a lot of room for when Scorpion's life occurred. He could have lived long before, slightly before, or even during Narmer's life. In this second theory, Scorpion was a ruler of Nechen around the same time that Narmer ruled Thinnis. There is some compelling evidence for this too as the previously mentioned Scorpion Macehead was found in Nechen, and Nechen's southern geographical position would explain his conflict with the Nubians. While Narmer was most well known for his conquest of Lower Egypt, some archaeologists believe that Upper Egypt was also politically disunited during Narmer's lifetime, and that Scorpion was one of the rivals that Narmer had to either ally with or defeat to unite the region. The third theory, and the one that I personally find the most compelling, is that Scorpion and Narmer are, in fact, one and the same. Narmer, as well as pretty much all later pharaohs, would use multiple names during his life. Narmer, for example, is what we call a Horus name, essentially the Egyptian equivalent of a royal title, while Menes was his birth name. For that reason, it's not unlikely that Narmer also possessed a third name, Scorpion, that he used early in his reign. The main support for this theory comes from the similarities between the depiction of Scorpion on the mace head and the depictions of Narmer, to the point that they are essentially identical. While it could be that these depictions were meant to capture the essence of a pharaoh, rather than their actual physical appearance, the intense similarity of these depictions is worth taking into consideration. A comparison image will be posted to the podcast blog if you would like to see this for yourself. Another piece of evidence used to support this hypothesis is the existence of another artifact depicting Scorpion, known as the Minor Scorpion Macehead. This artifact very strongly implies that Scorpion ruled over Lower Egypt as well as Upper Egypt, and ties him strongly to Narmer. So, assuming that Scorpion and Narmer are the same person, how he came to power remains unknown. He may have been a descendant, relative, or close friend of Ka, and succeeded him to the throne of Thinnis. As we discussed last podcast, Ka was an incredibly influential ruler, with signs of his rule being found throughout Upper and Lower Egypt. This rule over Lower Egypt, though, was likely a name only, as evidence for his rule in the region is limited to just a couple instances of his name popping up on artifacts, and there is no evidence of Ka ever being able to collect taxes in the Delta. So, Narmer found himself in control of a powerful, yet fragile, Thinite Empire. He controlled a vast territory in name, sure, but this territory was really only useful to him if he controlled the loyalty of his subjects within. Usually, when the ruler of an unstable state dies, a bunch of ambitious nobles decide to try and seize the throne or establish power bases for themselves. This was likely true when Narmer took the throne of Thinnis, and so the first few years of his reign were not spent expanding his holdings, but rather trying to secure Upper Egypt under his grasp. Narmer negotiated some Upper Egyptian nomarchs into an alliance known as the Thinite Confederacy. The Scorpion Macehead likely depicts this stage of Narmer's rule. In this depiction, Narmer wears the Hejet, a long, bowling pin-shaped crown, which symbolized rule over Upper Egypt, meaning that he had yet to unite all of Egypt at this point. As we noted earlier, there is compelling evidence that the Macehead depicts Narmer consolidating his rule over recently conquered land. After a series of conflicts with rival nomarchs, Narmer and his allies had stabilized their rule over Upper Egypt. With the loyalty of Upper Egypt ensured, Narmer could now turn his eyes to the ultimate goal, Egyptian unification. 
Narmer faced one remaining problem before he could launch his invasion of Lower Egypt. Sending his army north would leave Upper Egypt vulnerable to raids from Nubia. So, Narmer sent his army south into Nubia, launching a short invasion that stopped at the Second Cataract, and signing a peace with the locals to ensure that they wouldn't try anything while his army was gone. With peace in Nubia secured, Narmer's invasion of Lower Egypt could commence. We know little of Lower Egypt at the dawn of Narmer's invasion. Some scholars have claimed that Lower Egypt underwent a similar process of consolidation and unification as Upper Egypt, but I find that the evidence for this claim is pretty unconvincing. Before Narmer, Ka was never truly able to integrate this region under his rule, but the fact that he controlled the region even in name makes me doubt the existence of a united Lower Egypt. I see it being more likely that Lower Egypt had fragmented after the rule of Double Falcon into a couple dozen small gnomes. The only evidence of any sort of united rule of Lower Egypt comes from the Palermo Stone, a list of Egyptian rulers compiled much later. The existence of these dominant Lower Egyptian nomarchs is debatable at best, and even if they did exist, the lack of their royal seal on artifacts from pre-dynastic Lower Egypt shows that they were most likely rulers in name only. Therefore, Narmer's conquests of Lower Egypt were less so a war between two equal kingdoms, but rather a bloody slog through an alliance of Lower Egyptian city-states. Upon subjugating the last Lower Egyptian polity, Narmer commemorated his victory with the creation of one of the most important historical sources of all time, the Narmer Palette. If you'd like to visually follow along with my descriptions of the palette, I'll be posting a picture on the podcast blog. The Narmer Palette provides an incredibly stark picture of the view that Narmer projects of himself. On the front side of the palette, Narmer wears the familiar crown of Upper Egypt. In one hand, he wields a mace. In the other, he grabs the hair of a defeated foe, primed to bash in his skull. This man, a depiction of a lower Egyptian nomarch, is labeled with the name of his gnome, Wash. Below the feet of Narmer lie the corpses of two other nomarchs, also labeled with the names of lower Egyptian gnomes. As if to add insult to injury, a falcon, the symbol of Nehen's guardian deity, watches this execution approvingly. It was not enough for Narmer to show himself destroying the lower Egyptians, he had to make clear that the gods were on his side in this conquest. Because these people had technically been subjects of Thinnis before Narmer's invasion, the campaign in Lower Egypt likely resembled less a conquest of a foreign state, and more so the destruction of an internal revolt. Generally, the crushing of revolts in ancient times was far more brutal than the conquest of foreign enemies, as it was seen as necessary to make an example of rebellious peoples. We can see this brutality on display in the backside of the palette, with rows of decapitated bodies in front of Narmer. Narmer leads a victorious procession. He towers over the other men, as if to emphasize his divine superiority, and wears a crown called the Deshret, a crown worn by lower Egyptian nomarchs. The other men of the procession carry long poles with the symbols of Upper Egypt's protector gods, an interesting artistic choice that we'll discuss in further detail in just a little bit. Below this procession, two mythological beasts with incredibly long necks, known as sepopards, twist their necks in a sort of binding embrace. These beasts were worshipped as protectors in both Lower and Upper Egypt, and therefore this symbol can be interpreted as a metaphor for the binding of these two halves. The final section of this palette shows a bull, the symbol of the pharaoh, trampling over a lower Egyptian man. I don't think you need me to explain this one to you. So, Narmer has now militarily asserted himself as the sole authority of Egypt. This is an achievement for sure, but the hard part would be maintaining this newly united country. After all, like we discussed last episode, the Mahdi people of Lower Egypt were completely culturally distinct from the Nakata people of Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt most likely spoke a Cushitic language, while Lower Egypt spoke a Semitic language. Their gods, lifestyles, and artifacts were all incredibly different. To unite these lands, Narmer would have to create an entirely new Pan-Egyptian culture. The first step in this cultural unification was the creation of a new religion. If you listened to last week's episode, you'll remember that at this time, Egyptian gods largely fell into two categories, fertility gods and local protection deities. The protector of Abydos, Henti Amentu, was not widely worshipped in Nehen, 
where the falcon god Necheni was the supreme divine figure. As we saw in the Narmer palette, Narmer's procession marched with the symbols of multiple local gods, not just those from his home city of Thinis. These gods were all incorporated into Narmer's new religion. Hentiamentu became Osiris, Necheni became Horus, and Neketirian's protector beast became Set, god of the desert. As he conquered Lower Egypt, many of the local gods were also incorporated into this new religion, like Neith, the goddess of war and the patron god of the Lower Egyptian city of Sais. In addition to incorporating Lower Egyptian gods into this new society, Narmer also went to great lengths to incorporate Lower Egyptian people into his family. After his conquest, Narmer took a Lower Egyptian noblewoman named Neithhotep as his wife. Now, I know what you're thinking. Andy, how is seizing women from a conquered land supposed to improve relations with those people? And that would normally make sense. However, Neithhotep was no mere spoil of war. She possessed a very real degree of respect and power, and would even go on to briefly rule Egypt, making her the first female monarch in human history. If you'd like to learn more about Egypt's first queen, she'll be the focus of this week's premium episode. Egypt, after centuries of internal conflict between rival nomarchs, was finally pacified and unified. Narmer then turned his eye towards foreign policy. Relations with the Nubians were still stable from his earlier peace treaty, so Narmer's focus turned to the Near East. He led an expedition to the region of Canaan, now known as Israel-Palestine, for unknown reasons and with unknown means. Based on the marked increase of Egyptian-style pottery in Canaan after this expedition, his visit left a lasting cultural legacy in the region, but this impact did not outlive Narmer. I have a hard time believing that this was a mere trade mission. As one of the historical sources I've been relying on for this period, the writings of Manetho, states that Narmer won great renown during this expedition. And while it's possible, I highly doubt that Narmer's great speech skills and diplomatic prowess are what won him this great renown. My personal assumption is that Narmer took a small force to collect tribute from the peoples of Canaan, and established a sort of Egyptian soft power in the region, but that's just conjecture. Narmer's early reign was defined by violent conflict, so it might come as a surprise that his reign concluded in a prolonged peace. For this reason, I find it ironic that Narmer was killed in a violent manner. Our source, Manetho, writes that Narmer was killed by a hippopotamus, an anticlimactic and honestly slightly wacky end for such a historically significant man. However, I'm not one for anticlimactic endings, so I'll add a bit of speculation. Some translations of Manetho that I have seen credit not a hippopotamus, but rather a hippopotamus god with the death of Narmer. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty skeptical of any claims that ancient Egyptian hippo gods are just wandering around killing pharaohs. So perhaps Narmer was poisoned, or murdered by a rival, or done in by some familial intrigue, and the perpetrator blamed this on the will of some hippo god. Or maybe he was just crushed to death by a literal hippopotamus while taking a dip in the Nile. I'll let you decide which story you prefer. Narmer was buried at Abydos next to his predecessor, Ka, in an incredibly humble tomb for a man of his importance. Perhaps Narmer's greatest achievement is in what didn't happen after he died. Rather than reverting back to a series of squabbling independent gnomes, as had happened after the death of previous rulers, Egypt stayed united after Narmer's death. Narmer's son was named Horus Aha, which means Fighting Falcon. Aha, as the son of Narmer in Neithhotep, was half Upper and half Lower Egyptian. However, this did not necessarily guarantee that his rule would be accepted by these newly incorporated Lower Egyptians. While Egypt was now under the control of one pharaoh, the kingdom was less one united country and more two separate countries stapled together by Aha's rule, an ancient form of a personal union. His capital, Thinis, was located pretty far south, and thus pretty far from the delta, making it hard to regulate trade and taxation in Lower Egypt. Facing this problem, Aha made an incredibly bold decision to build an entirely new capital. This new city, Memphis would be strategically located in the middle region between Upper and Lower Egypt, so that the pharaoh could keep a close eye on both of his domains. 
The decision to move the capital to Memphis may have also had a religious motivation. Aha was an avid worshipper of Neith, the goddess of war, and Memphis was far closer to Sais, meaning that Aha could spend more time in the temples, sacrificing to the war goddess. This shifting of the capital northwards would be the longest lasting legacy of Aha's reign, and would permanently root the power of Egypt's early dynasties in Memphis. Throughout his rule, Egypt's foreign policy gradually shifted south. The treaty that his father had signed with the Nubians had expired, and war broke out soon after. This war likely lasted a long time, consuming much of Aha's attention and much of Egypt's resources. As Nubia became the focus of Aha, the Near Eastern region slipped further from Egypt's influence. For the next few centuries, the influence of the pharaohs was contained entirely to the Nile Valley. This decline in influence was coupled with a decline in trade, and the Middle Eastern influence in Egyptian culture would also steadily decline. Aha's reign lasted a long time, and, like his father, he was able to successfully pass his rule on to his son. The details of his death are unknown, but he left Egypt in a state of stability and prosperity. No prosperity lasts forever, though. Join us next week as we learn how the first dynasty of Egypt slowly crumbled into oblivion, and witness a new dynasty rise in its place. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we left off with the death of Horus Aha, Egypt's second pharaoh. This week, we'll examine what little we know about the rest of Egypt's first dynasty, and learn how Egypt's first line of pharaohs met its end. Without further ado, let's begin. Episode 5, The Best Pharaoh You've Never Heard Of. If you listened to last week's premium episode, you'll know that after Horus Aha died, the rule did not immediately pass to his son Jer. Rather, it passed to his mother and possible wife, Nithotep. Nithotep ruled as a temporary regent until her grandson was old enough to become pharaoh in his own right. While she reigned, though, she was treated like any other pharaoh, that is to say, she was incredibly revered and respected. Her reign ended after her grandson came of age and she died soon after. We know pretty much nothing about how successful her reign was, and practically nothing about the details of her reign at all. However, after her death, she was buried in what was Egypt's most luxurious tomb at the time, which might indicate that Egypt was especially prosperous at the time of her death. Now, before we continue, I want to talk a little bit about what happened to pharaohs after they died. If there's one thing we all associate with Egypt, its pyramids. And while pyramids won't be built until a couple of episodes in the future, the precursor to pyramids is being created right now. These structures, called mastabas, take the form of rectangular piles of mud bricks, sloping slightly upwards until they reach a flat roof at the top. Basically, imagine if someone took a small pyramid and then sliced off the top two-thirds of it. Early mastabas were essentially a house built for a dead person with a layout resembling that of a standard house from that time, though this design would eventually be scrapped for a new design that was harder for grave robbers to navigate. At the center of the mastaba was the sarcophagus room, where the body of the pharaoh was laid to rest. This room was also packed with many of the pharaoh's worldly treasures, furniture, and servants. Yes, you heard that right, servants. During the early dynastic period, the royal attendants were killed and buried with the pharaoh so that they could continue to serve in the afterlife, if you'd like to learn more about the practice of human sacrifice in early Egypt, and how this practice would eventually come to be abolished, that will be the topic of this week's premium episode for our supporters on Patreon. Anyways, little is known about the rule of Jer. He ruled for an incredible 40 years though, which implies that his rule was most likely stable and prosperous, as unsuccessful rulers rarely last that long. Jer engaged in multiple military campaigns in both Nubia and the Near East. The rule would pass on to his son, Jet. Jet would rule for a much shorter time than his father, 
only 10 years. His name is likely related to Wacha, the protector deity of Lower Egypt. This might indicate that his reign, or the reign of his father, saw an increase in the power and influence of Lower Egypt within the First Dynasty. Little else is known about his reign, though I do want to make a quick note about what happened after his death. Soon after his death, Jets Mastaba in Abydos was almost immediately destroyed. This could indicate that his rule was unpopular, or that the city saw a surge in instability after his death. Jets' heir, Den, was too young to rule when his father passed. His wife, and possibly also his sister, was a woman named Marineith. She would, like her great-grandmother, play the role of regent until Den was old enough to rule for himself. Unlike Nithotep, though, Marineith was never technically the pharaoh herself, and while her name is often included in Egyptian kings' lists, it usually isn't surrounded by the royal serech associated with the pharaoh. Instead, she went by a more humble title, Mother of the Pharaoh. Like the rest of the First Dynasty, she was buried in Abydos. Interestingly, like the name of her great-grandmother, Marineith also implies a connection to Neith, the goddess of weaving and war. She won't be the last queen of Egypt with Neith in her name, either. It's tempting to chalk this up to being a coincidence, but I think it's more likely that powerful women in Egypt were able to attach a layer of prestige to themselves by associating their name with that of such a martial goddess. The length of Marineith's rule is unknown, but it's likely that she continued to have a strong influence on her son even after he took the throne for himself. You wouldn't know about her not being a pharaoh on a technicality if you only looked at her tomb, though. Marineith's tomb is actually larger than that of her husband, and even contains the oldest example of a solar boat, a ship that would be buried with Egyptian pharaohs to aid their transportation into the afterlife. Marineith stepped down from power after her son, Den, came of ruling age. Den is the last good pharaoh of the First Dynasty. If you watched the previous episode, You'll remember that I stated that Upper and Lower Egypt were still two separate kingdoms which just happened to be ruled by the same king in an ancient version of a personal union. Well, this status quo had remained true throughout the rules of Nithotep, Gen, Jet, and Marineith. Den, however, would put an end to this practice. Those previous pharaohs used two separate titles, King of Upper Egypt and King of Lower Egypt, depending on the circumstances. In Upper Egypt, they wore the white bowling pin shaped crown of Upper Egypt, and while in Lower Egypt, they wore the curly red crown of Lower Egypt. Essentially, each early pharaoh had two related but distinct jobs. Den did away with this practice, and united his title to become the first pharaoh to call himself King of Upper and Lower Egypt. This might seem like unimportant semantics, but this new practice did away with the old status quo of one Egypt, two systems. Egypt was no longer two states with one ruler, it was now one state with one ruler. In place of the two crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt, Den wore a single crown, in which the white crown of Upper Egypt was fitted inside a red crown of Lower Egypt. Every pharaoh after Den would continue the practice of wearing this double crown. He also introduced the wearing of the Nemes, a striped headdress worn by Egyptian pharaohs. If you've ever seen the famous golden mask of King Tutankhamun, then the Nemi should be familiar to you. It's the headdress he wears around the back of his head. The time of Den's reign was a golden age of innovation in ancient Egypt. During this period, the first formal system of numerical writing and hieroglyphs was introduced. This meant that things like years and tax records, obviously incredibly important to the operation of such a kingdom, could now be written in hieroglyphs. This period also saw massive innovations in Egyptian religious practice. Den introduced the worship of the ancient bull, in which an especially strong bull from the city of Apis would be designated as the son of the goddess Hathor, and be subjective to incredibly devoted worship. Den also introduced a new holiday which would last throughout the entirety of Egyptian history, known as Heb Sed. This holiday was meant to celebrate the continuation of the rule of the pharaoh, and was celebrated with a feast every 30 years. The pharaoh would sprint back and forth between two large stelae to prove his continual potency and physical fitness. 
Hebb said, is an important holiday to Egyptologists as well, as it provides a fairly accurate way to date how long the rule of the pharaoh lasts. Finally, many of the oldest funerary practices established in the Book of the Dead are attributed to Den, as are many of the processionary rituals which would long be associated with the pharaoh. These rituals would not only be practiced long after Den himself passed, but would continue to be practiced until the widespread introduction of Christianity in Egypt in the 3rd century AD. Talk about leaving a legacy behind. To make his rule even more impressive, this golden age of innovation did not occur during easy, peaceful times, but rather during times of great hardship and strife. Egyptian records from Den's reign make their first mention of the Eunedi, or Bo people. These mysterious people, completely unknown outside of Egyptian records, would become an ongoing problem for the pharaohs of the First Dynasty. During Den's reign, they migrated into the Sinai Peninsula, and began raiding the trade caravans that crossed back and forth between Egypt and Canaan. He even occasionally invaded the Egyptian settlements on the fringes of the Nile Valley. Den decided to put a stop to this practice, launching a full-scale war against the Eunedi. An artifact known as Den's Ivory Label shows Den in the smiting pose, similar to the stance portrayed on the Narmer palette. In one hand, he holds a mace high, ready to swing down, and in the other hand, he grasps the hair of a kneeling enemy. Like on the Narmer palette, a falcon, the symbol of Horus, watches approvingly, though this time he is joined by the symbol of the desert god, Set. I believe that the inclusion of Set on this artifact is meant to show that Den was not just the master of the land of Horus, Egypt, but was also the master of the land of Set, or Egypt's surrounding deserts. Den would lead two more military campaigns in the Sinai, and emerge victorious in all three. If a foreign war wasn't hard enough to manage already, Den also had to manage the onset of a plague, one of the oldest disease outbreaks in recorded history, though how successful he was in this task is unclear. Den died after ruling for more than 40 years, and proved himself to be the most effective pharaoh since his great-great-grandfather, Narmer. Even his place of rest showcases the innovativeness of his rule. Before Den, mastabas were built in a peculiar manner. First, the pharaoh would be laid to rest with their possessions and servants in a pit. And then, the mastaba's structure would be built on top of this pit. Den's mastaba, though, was built differently. It was built before he died, and featured a spiral staircase down which the body of the pharaoh would be lowered. This innovation would prove crucial to later Egyptian pharaohs, as it allowed them to plan out their tomb before they died, rather than rely on their successor to build it for them. Therefore, the later practice of building increasingly magnificent mastabas, and eventually the practice of building pyramids can, like many other things in Egyptian history, be attributed in part to Den's rule. While writing this episode, I was astounded by just how important Den's rule was to Egyptian history. I looked up some pop history top 10 lists of the best pharaohs in Egyptian history as a sort of measuring stick of the mainstream understanding of ancient Egypt, and Den was listed on none of them. So in the future, if someone asks you who was the most underrated pharaoh of ancient Egypt, you can say you know the answer. Part of the reason why Den is so unknown relative to his accomplishment is that he was partially erased from history by his successor, Anajib. Who Anajib was is a mystery. He may have been the son, brother, or rival of Den. His rule is not very well attested to, but what little we know does not reflect well on him. Anajib has two separate Hebsed stones attributed to his name, which at first seems to imply that he enjoyed a long, prosperous rule. However, there is strong evidence that these stones were in fact lifted from Den's tomb, and that Den's name was erased on them and Anajib's name was written in its place, sort of like how people steal images from deviant art today. Anajib's rule was contentious, and he had to deal with near-constant rebellions throughout his reign, especially in Lower Egypt. One of the few depictions of Anajib is him completing the Hebsed ritual of running between the stones, but this depiction has been graffitied with the marking of a single word, calamity. This points to some terrible disaster taking place during his reign, 
In the end, his rule did not last long, likely lasting less than nine years. Onagib was buried in Abydos with the rest of the First Dynasty kings, in an incredibly small and unimpressive Mastaba. His successor was Semerhet, a man who we know little about. Egyptologists once believed Semerhet to be a usurper. This is because, much like the pharaohs, some important royal advisors and officials had impressive tombs. In these tombs, they would usually brag about their service to the pharaoh, as this was seen as a great honor. Unlike his predecessors, though, Semerhet is not attested to in any of the tombs of these royal officials, showing that nobody wanted to be associated with his reign. Combined with the fact that he had a habit of erasing Onagib's name and replacing it with his own on artifacts, scholars long assumed this meant that he was a pretender. However, this theory has fallen out of favor recently, due to later pharaohs listing him as a legitimate predecessor. It's more likely that this lack of attention from royal officials comes from the fact that Semerhet had a short and unsuccessful reign, likely lasting less than eight years. My personal speculation is that he was more of a reverse usurper, that he had a legitimate claim to the rule of Den, and that he retook the throne from Onagib. This lines up well with the speculation that Onagib himself may have been a usurper, and the large number of rebellions that he had to deal with during his reign. Perhaps one of these rebellions was successful in elevating Samarhet to the throne. Regardless of his legitimacy, his rule would be incredibly disastrous for Egypt. Manetho describes a great disaster befalling Egypt during his reign, while the historical record of his reign describes the destruction of Egypt occurring at the start of his career as a pharaoh. The causes of this massive calamity are unknown, though some likely candidates include the fallout with his speculated civil war with Anijib, a renewed war with the Iuneti, a serious set of droughts, the onset of a major epidemic of disease, or a combination of these factors. Semerhet was succeeded by Kebe, also known as Ka. Unlike his predecessors, Kebe's reign would be relatively long and stable, and there is no evidence of any prolonged rebellions in Egypt at this time. His reign lasted for 26 years, and he enjoyed multiple victories over the Iuneti and Canaan though the details of these campaigns, or really any details about his reign, are scant. What is known is that Keba did not produce an heir, and that would ultimately be the downfall of his reign. After his death, three powerful nomarchs would compete for the throne of Egypt, and after a bloody civil war, Hotep Sekenwi, the progenitor of the Second Dynasty, would emerge victorious. Join us next week to learn about the outcome of this civil war, and about the fascinating history of Egypt's mysterious Second Dynasty. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com, by giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello there, my name is Craig, host of the Pacific War Channel podcast. If you like learning about the history of the African continent, I bet you'd also enjoy learning about the history of the Asia-Pacific War. Our current season is focused on the history of China and Japan during the 19th century. If that sounds appealing to you, please come check us out at the Pacific War Channel podcast here on YouTube, Podbean, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. Back to you, Andy. Hello, everyone. And welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Today we'll be taking a close look at the Second Dynasty of Egypt, the many calamities that befell them, and the pharaohs who remanded them. Now, let's begin. Episode 6, Egypt is Shattered. So, last week we talked about the later years of the First Dynasty, and to briefly recap, things were going pretty well until a series of disasters befell Egypt around 2900 BC. While the exact causes are unknown, there is some clear historical evidence, like a reduction in the size and splendor of royal tombs, that Egypt experienced a period of steep economic decline. There is also some evidence that rebellions, rising pretenders, and foreign wars were commonplace during the late First Dynasty period, obviously signs of a very unstable state. 
We left off with Keba taking the throne, and despite being a successful ruler by all accounts, he would be the last of his dynasty to rule Egypt. Keba, specifically, reminds me of a leader from the 20th century, longtime Yugoslav president Josip Broz Tito. Both took charge of an unstable country on the verge of collapse. Both led their nation for a long time, and both presided over a period of economic prosperity and stability. However, Keba and Tito also shared each other's negative traits, namely their inability to share power. Keba proved either unable or unwilling to produce a successor, and as a result, like Yugoslavia in the 90s, Egypt fractured into a bloody civil war after his death. Now, tracking something as chaotic as a civil war is difficult even when the civil war is going on right now. But just imagine how hard it is to try and piece together a conflict that happened 4,900 years ago, and that every participant in the conflict also decided to go by multiple names. So, for this reason, the details of how the civil war played out are uncertain. So, after Keba dies, a civil war breaks out between two powerful people. The first is a man named Horusberg, about whom pretty much nothing is known about. In fact, the only evidence of his reign is a few artifacts that show his name encased in a royal seraph, implying that someone with this name claimed to be the pharaoh of Egypt during this chaotic period. His opponent in this conflict was a man named Sneferka, who has an equally short biography. His existence is only attested to by a few artifacts, on which the name Keba is erased and replaced with his own. This could be taken as evidence that Horusberg was a more legitimate successor, and that Sneferka didn't claim to be a descendant of Keba. Uh, but this isn't just a stretch, this is a whole yoga session. Ultimately, who Horusberg and Sneferka were is a complete mystery. They could have been relatives or children of Keba, bureaucrats, nomarchs, or just random, charismatic dudes during a time of crisis. In Sneferka's case, there's even some evidence that he may have been a she. The Serik, containing the name of Sneferka, lacks a falcon standing atop it, a practice that is only done by one previous ruler, the Queen Marinith. This opens up the possibility that Sneferka was maybe one of Keba's wives, but we don't really know. How this war played out is a complete mystery, though some evidence from the city of Abydos during this period indicates that it was incredibly destructive. The best evidence of such destruction comes from the tomb of Keba himself, which was completely leveled during the fighting in the city. Remember, a couple of weeks ago I said that the crushing of domestic revolts is usually much more destructive and brutal in a foreign conquest, and this civil war would have been no different. How this war ended is unclear. One of the few things we know for certain is that it ended with the elevation of a new pharaoh, Hotep Sechemwi, to the throne. More is known about Hotep Sechemwi than Sneferka or Horusberg, but that's not saying much, as his biography is also relatively mysterious. He was likely from Upper Egypt, and his name tells us a little bit about how he viewed himself. Hotep Sechemwi roughly translates to The two powers are reconciled, or the two lands are at peace. This strongly implies that he was in part responsible for putting an end to Egypt's civil war though how he did this is unknown. Maybe he crushed both of the pretenders militarily, or maybe he was kind of a compromise candidate that both factions in the war could accept. There's also a chance that he was a close ally of either Sneferka or Horusberg, and that one of these two won the war, and that Hotep Sechemwi elevated himself to the throne after they experienced a short rule. We don't really know. Regardless, some way or another, Hotep Sechemwi ended the war and reunited Egypt under his reign. His rule is pretty poorly attested to as well, but it seems to have been relatively stable. His main task was to try and rebuild Egypt after the devastating civil war. One of his first acts as pharaoh was to rebuild the destroyed tomb of Keba. This is an interesting decision, as it shows that Hotep Sechemwi wanted to depict himself as a successor to the first dynasty, protecting and maintaining the legacy of the past pharaohs, rather than trying to replace it. He also went to immediate work building a new residence for the pharaohs, which might imply that the last one had been destroyed during the civil war, or maybe tainted by the presence of a pretender. This spree of rebuilding seems to show a booming economic recovery during Hotep Sechemwi's reign. Pretty much nothing is known about the foreign or religious policy of Egypt during this time. Fortunately though, our main source, Manetho, only records the most important information. He records that a sinkhole opened up in the city of Perbas during Hotep Sechemwi's reign and some people fell in. Wow, 
Good to know. We don't know where Hotep Sechemwe's tomb is located, and until it's discovered, his rule will likely remain enigmatic. Hotep Sechemwe's effort to reunite Egypt was not in vain, as the rule passed successfully and peacefully to his successor, Nebra. Little is known about Nebra's reign, but what little is known points to it being relatively uneventful, but stable. The only really significant thing about Nebra is that he was the first pharaoh that we're pretty certain is buried at a location other than Abydos. Instead, he was buried in Saqqara, a tomb complex outside of Memphis. This points to the continuation of a trend we've been seeing since the rule of Horus Aha about 200 years prior. Aha moved Egypt's capital from Thinis, the hometown of Egypt's very earliest pharaohs, to the new city of Memphis. However, while Memphis was the new capital, the continual practice of burying pharaohs in Abydos, a city that you remember is right next to Thinis, shows that the old capital still occupied a crucial religious role during the First Dynasty. The decision, then, to move the pharaoh's grave to Memphis was another example of the new capital's continual rise at the expense of the old. Nebra's reign was short, and he was succeeded by Nineshare. Now, we're not certain what Nineshare's relationship to Nebra was, but we're pretty certain that he wasn't his son. Nebra had only one son, and he went on to become a member of the Egyptian priesthood. Maybe the son was just seen as unfit to rule, or maybe he just didn't want to and thus Ninjer took the throne instead. Ninjer would go on to rule for a miraculous 45 years. Ninjer's reign was incredibly successful. He led victorious campaigns against Nubia, and by all accounts enjoyed economic prosperity. One of the reasons for this success was because of his practice of delegation. Previous pharaohs held an immense amount of personal power, and were usually unwilling to share this power with much of anyone. If you go back to episode 3, you'll remember that I talked a lot about nomarchs, or the leaders of Egyptian city-states in the pre-dynastic era. Well, nomarchs were still around at this time, albeit in a much reduced role. Rather than serving as kings of their city-states, nomarchs by the second dynasty period were more like mayors or governors. Sure, they still had some power within their dome, but they were clearly subservient to the pharaoh. While nomarchs handled things like policing, organizing street cleanings, and small agricultural products, you know, local government stuff, a lot of surprisingly local tasks were still controlled directly by the pharaoh. For example, the Palermo Stone, an artifact that documents the reign of various pharaohs, documents some of the tasks that the pharaohs would do that seem surprisingly menial for someone as revered as them. Jer, for example, personally oversaw the construction of statues in small town temples, while Den apparently was personally involved in conducting multiple censuses. Major infrastructure projects, like the construction of irrigation systems and roads, were also directly overseen by the pharaoh, not to mention the ever-growing number of religious festivals and rituals that the pharaoh needed to complete. A small army of minor officials, like scribes and treasurers, would report directly to the pharaoh with their various concerns, reports, and requests. This type of micromanagement, while effective, was probably pretty tiring for these pharaohs to deal with. I mean, Ninjer, I'm glad you finished taking the census, but now you need to direct the construction of a canal in Nechen, and we need you to go open the new temple in Sais, and don't forget that you need to check up on the Apis Bowl too, and you should also probably make a legal ruling on that murder that happened in Thinis last week, I mean, after all, you are the son of Horus, and who knows justice better than you, and we heard that the Iuneti are up to trouble in Canaan again, so you should probably go raise an army to deal with that. I mean, by the light of Amun-Ra, just let the man rest for a minute. Niger's solution to this ever-growing list of responsibilities was the creation of a new system of bureaucracy. The most important position in this new bureaucracy was the vizier. The vizier was the second most powerful person in Egypt, submitting only to the pharaoh himself. He was the main authority in charge of all the pharaoh's earthly matters, like making sure taxes are getting paid, nomarchs are getting their jobs done right, irrigation projects are getting built, you know, government stuff. That small army of bureaucrats would channel their comments to the vizier instead of the pharaoh, so he could handle the less important ones, and report only the most important matters to the pharaoh himself. Religious matters were delegated primarily to a complex structure of priests, with each god in the Egyptian pantheon having their own cult of worship. These priests would oversee the conduction of sacrifices, minor rituals, and other standard religious stuff. 
The pharaoh, who was seen as the son of the god Horus himself, was above such lowly rituals, and would only conduct the most important festivals and ceremonies. This new bureaucratic system vastly increased the efficiency of the Egyptian government, as matters could be attended to much faster. However, it also meant that an increasingly large amount of power was held by the bureaucracy and not the pharaoh himself, and opened up new avenues for corruption. For example, who's going to stop the tax collector in Thinnis from accepting bribes now that the pharaoh couldn't interact with him directly anymore? This expansion of bureaucracy, while useful, quickly developed into a crisis, with the vizier and his lackeys holding an ever-growing amount of power. This bureaucratic crisis resulted in Egypt's government not being able to respond to a real crisis, when Egypt was struck by a series of droughts and financial woes. And then, after 47 years on the throne, Niger died, and Egypt fractured into multiple kingdoms. How this happened is up for debate. Niger had multiple sons and some scholars claim that he believed that dividing Egypt into two kingdoms would allow his sons to better deal with the challenge of managing expanding bureaucracy. Kinda like how the Roman Empire was intentionally divided between two states near the end of its life. Others argue that this division was not planned, but that the eroding of the centralized power of the pharaoh resulted in a gradual decline of the royal authority after Niger's reign. Regardless, Egypt was divided into two kingdoms. One kingdom was based in Upper Egypt, and another in Lower Egypt. The history of the rulers of these kingdoms is incredibly jumbled, with it not really being clear at any given time who is ruling what. But we do know that these kingdoms were completely separate and independent. Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt had separate rulers, bureaucracies, and economies. Each kingdom conducted a separate treasury, run by a separate set of administrators. They even conducted different religious practices. The Lower Egyptian state, based in Memphis, continued the tradition of the Second Dynasty, burying their pharaohs at Saqqara. The Upper Egyptians, on the other hand, renewed the older practice of being buried at Abydos. One Upper Egyptian ruler, Set Peribsen, even attempted a massive religious shift that completely reordered the Egyptian pantheon. As his name implies, Set Peribsen primarily worshipped Set, god of the desert. Remember how Set originated as the protector beast of Nekaterian? Well, it seems that Nekaterian remained the center of Set worship in early Egypt, and that this cult of Set had a major influence on Peribsen's religious views. On previous royal seraphs, a falcon, the symbol of Horus, stood watch over the pharaoh's name. However, on Peribsen's serif, it is the symbol of Set instead. Previous pharaohs had claimed to be the descendants of Horus, but Peribsen instead claimed to be of the line of Set. Lower Egyptian pharaohs, on the other hand, continued the old practice of using Horus on this serif, which shows that, if not for what happened next, we might have seen Upper and Lower Egyptian religions sever more permanently during this era. However, this division would not continue for much longer. In 2700 BC, Peribsen's son, Khazi Kemwe, took over after his father passed into the afterlife. Kazakemwe's name means the two powers appear, a name I'll elaborate on in a bit. He was likely the son of Peribsen, and ascended to the throne shortly after his father died. Not much about his early reign is known. However, it appears that at some point during his rule, relations with the lower Egyptians broke down. This was not especially unusual, as the relationship between Upper and Lower Egypt during this time was not always positive and sometimes even resulted in small skirmishes between the two kingdoms. At the time, Lower Egypt was ruled by a man named, well, we don't really know. Most Egyptologists refer to him by the pseudonym, Hujifa, meaning missing. This is because, on ancient Egyptian kings lists, his space is intentionally left blank. Essentially, his name is the Egyptian equivalent of writing N slash A on a form. Why relations between Hujifa and Khazekhemwe broke down is unknown. Maybe the religious differences between the two kingdoms became too much to handle. Or maybe Hujifa fancied himself to be the next Narmer, because it would be him who threw the first punch. He launched an unprecedented invasion deep into Upper Egypt, and Khazekhemwe was completely powerless to stop this onslaught. Lower Egypt had long ago surpassed Upper Egypt in both wealth and population. Thus, Hujifa had a larger army, and could afford to give them superior weapons and supplies. 
First the capital, Phoenix, then Oliver's, and then Nicotier, and he helped his mighty lower age war. Soon he has a number of the river for the most upper age of war, controlled over the southernmost city of the day, and his nearby son. dramatic defense. Endless legions of lower Egyptians tried and failed to overtake the city, being slaughtered en masse in the process. On an engraved vase, Kazehemwe is watched approvingly by Nechbet, the protector deity of Upper Egypt, as he dominates the lower Egyptian army. The lower Egyptian pharaoh, Hujifa, had exhausted all of his men and resources in his failed invasion. This was the perfect situation for Kazehemwe, as he could retake Lower Egypt while facing little to no resistance, and thus the infrastructure and buildings of this region could be undamaged. Egypt was united once more. Chazakemwe was pretty different from his ancient predecessor, the uniter of Egypt, Narmer. Narmer set out to unite Egypt, while Chazakemwe had united Egypt pretty much by accident. However, his methods for reuniting this fractured kingdom after the war were fairly similar to those taken by Narmer. He immediately took a lower Egyptian noblewoman, Nematop, as his wife, and together they would form a new Egyptian dynasty. Again like Narmer, Khazahemwe used religion as a tool to heal Egypt's divide. He united the traditional veneration of Horus with the popular cult of Set promoted by his father, and became the only pharaoh to use both of these gods in his royal serif. The two powers referred to in his name might have a double meaning referring to both Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and to Set and Horus. Finally, Kazehemwe took drastic steps to reduce the power of the bureaucracy, restoring the absolute power of the pharaoh. There was never any record of Kazehemwe appointing a vizier during his reign, and if he did, it's pretty telling of this vizier's lack of power that no records even exist that mention him. Kazehemwe also did away with the separation of Upper and Lower Egyptian bureaucracies, restoring the old One Egypt, One System rule of the past. He merged the upper and lower treasuries and used their combined funds to stimulate the economy through a series of massive building projects. One of these projects was the Shunet El Zabib Temple in Abydos, the largest religious center ever built in Egypt at that point. In fact, this structure was so large and grand that when Egyptologists first discovered it, they thought it was meant to be a massive military fortress. He also constructed the great enclosure of Saqqara, a structure of unknown purpose that was one of the earliest stone structures in Egyptian history. By the end of Khazakhemwe's reign, Egypt was the most prosperous it had ever been at that point. However, despite all of his successes, Khazakhemwe did not rule for long, achieving all of this in just 12 years. He was the last pharaoh to be buried in Abydos alongside the other great pharaohs of Thinis, in Abydos's grandest tomb. Khazakhemwe's rule was one of the most important in Egyptian history. When he took power, Egypt was in a state of extended crisis, separated into two squabbling kingdoms, and overtaken by religious disorder. Had he not reunited Egypt, we have no idea what the rest of Egyptian and even human history might have looked like. But by the end of his reign, the foundation was set for Egypt to begin one of its longest golden ages, known as the Old Kingdom. Join us next week as we learn about what Kazakhemwe's son, Djoser, would do with this newfound wealth and stability. Here's a hint, it's pyramid shaped. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com by giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we witnessed the last pharaoh of the Second Dynasty, Hazahemwe, as he ended the long series of crises that rocked Egypt throughout the late proto-dynastic period, and reunited a fractured Egypt into one kingdom. He left Egypt in a state of prosperity and stability, this week, 
we'll see his successors extend that prosperity and build some of the greatest monuments in human history. Episode 7, Egypt's Age of Gold. So, if you're a big fan of Egyptian history, you've probably heard of the Three Kingdoms before, the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms. These kingdoms represent times when Egypt experienced a long period of great prosperity and stability, when innovation and culture and crafts were flourishing. However, records from the Old Kingdom, especially its later dynasties, are pretty sparse. For this reason, most of what we know about Old Kingdom pharaohs comes from their buildings and statues, and their political activities remain somewhat obscure by comparison. Hasehemwe's death is usually regarded as the beginning of the Old Kingdom period. In the last episode, we learned that Hasehemwe died at a surprisingly young age, ruling for only 12 years. His son, Djoser, was only a small child when his father died. So as was customary, the boy's mother, Nematop, acted as regent while the boy pharaoh grew up. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering why Djoser is considered the start of a new dynasty. I mean, he's the son of the last pharaoh, so shouldn't he be in the same dynasty as that pharaoh? Well, the Egyptians actually viewed family ties a little bit differently than how we view them, as they saw them as flowing through the mother's line, not the father's. This also explains why incestuous marriages were so common, as marrying your mother or sister was seen as the only way to truly preserve the dynasty. So, while Djoser was the son of Hazahemwe, he was seen as being from Nematop's family line, and since she wasn't part of the second dynasty, neither is Djoser. Anyways, Nematop enjoyed nowhere near the power of previous motherly regions. Unlike Nithotep and Meredith, her name does not appear on any royal serifs, and she is not listed on any king's lists. This exclusion indicates that Nematop never truly held much royal power, and really only filled the role of assisting young Djoser with his religious duties, while the bureaucracy handled the earthly matters. The boy rarely left Memphis, and lived a comfortable, privileged lifestyle in the royal palace. When he came of age, he ascended to the throne of Egypt. Throughout his reign, Djoser would permanently live in Memphis, becoming the first pharaoh of the United Egypt to permanently reside in the capital city at pretty much all times. Djoser's first task as pharaoh involved the long-time enemies of ancient Egypt, the Eunedi. These Middle Eastern nomads were expert archers, and often caused trouble for Egyptian settlements near the Sinai Peninsula, and even raided merchant caravans that crossed between Canaan and Egypt. Between these people and the Egyptians were perpetually tense as a result, with multiple pharaohs of the first and second dynasties leading expeditions into the Sinai to pacify them. Djoser ordered the creation of another one of these military expeditions to crush the Eunedi. The expedition was a success. However, during this military expedition, some Egyptian soldiers noticed that the region had an abundance of valuable minerals, including valuable luxury stones like turquoise and dolomite, but most importantly, copper. To the Old Kingdom Egyptians, copper was everything. They farmed, built, and fought with copper tools. Therefore, with the discovery of copper, Djoser knew that this region was too valuable to let go. Instead, he converted the expedition into a more permanent military occupation, with prospectors and miners joining the soldiers. The Eunedi were never mentioned again in Egyptian records, likely fleeing from this invasion never to return, or perhaps massacred by the invading Egyptian army. With security ensured in the Sinai, Djoser's eye turned to domestic policy. To assist him in this field, he enlisted a man named Emotep. Emotep was an important bureaucratic official who wore many different hats, from head of the royal shipyard to head masonry overseer. He never technically held the title of vizier, as he was a commoner, and that position was reserved only for royal family members. But he held all the power and prestige that the position implies. Emotep was something of the da Vinci of ancient Egypt, a renaissance man in the truest sense of the word. Emotep's foremost interest was in medicine, which might explain why he became so close to the pharaoh. Speculating, I think it's likely that Djoser, or one of his loved ones, came down with an illness, and that Emotep was the physician who cured them of this disease. Or perhaps Djoser just recognized his talents from afar and gradually promoted him over time. He would become a chief advisor of the pharaoh in matter of state, arts, architecture, and religion.
In one ancient Egyptian folk story, Egypt is hit by a famine due to a lack of floods from the Nile. Djoser immediately turns to Imhotep for advice, who instructs the pharaoh on the proper way to conduct sacrifices for Hanum, the god of the Nile, and thus alleviates the famine. The story of Djoser's famine is apocryphal, as it was first recorded thousands of years after his reign, but I think it accurately reflects something about the amount of influence that a man like Imhotep had in religious matters. Remember that Egypt had just come out of a major religious transformation at the end of the Second Dynasty, and that the cult of Set was still an influential faction within the Egyptian priestly class. The previous pharaoh, Khazakemwe, claimed descent from both Set and Horus during his reign, as means to alleviate the tension between the two factions. And there's some evidence that Djoser continued this practice during the early years of his reign. However, it seems that Djoser abruptly ended the official veneration of Set, a decision that may have been influenced by Imhotep. Set would remain an important god in the Egyptian pantheon, but his status as an equal to Horus was vastly demoted. The trust and respect that Imhotep enjoyed is exemplified most by Djoser's decision to let him design the pharaoh's tomb. Typically, as had been the case after Den started the practice, pharaohs would design and begin construction on their own tomb while they were still alive, and would then entrust their successor to finish the proper rites and burial practices. Egyptian funerary practices were incredibly precise, and a small mistake in burial or construction of a tomb could result in the pharaoh not being able to experience the afterlife. Therefore, it's very telling of Djoser's trust that he instructed Imhotep to design and build his tomb. Clearly honored by this decision, Imhotep set out to design the most ambitious and magnificent tomb Egypt had ever seen. Prior to Djoser, all pharaohs were buried in a very specific type of tomb, called a mastaba. A mastaba is essentially a big cube made of mud bricks, with a flat roof, and sides that slope slightly upwards. In an earlier episode, I asked you to envision essentially a small pyramid with its top third sliced off. The point of this structure was to act as essentially a cap on the pharaoh's tomb, to protect those buried inside from the elements and from grave robbers. Throughout the first and second dynasties, these mastabas had gradually grown and shrunk in scale, but all largely followed the same plan. Some previously ambitious pharaohs of Lower Egypt had experimented with the design of stacking two or three mastabas on top of each other, but were mostly unable to build these projects at any grand scale due to the poor economic state of Egypt, limiting the resources and labor at their disposal. Due to the good economic conditions, however, Imhotep had a near limitless amount of resources at his disposal, and his ambitious design would completely turn Egyptian tomb building techniques on its head. In order to showcase the grandness of the pharaoh Djoser, Imhotep figured that one mastaba was simply insufficient. Rather, he envisioned Djoser receiving not one, but many distinct mastabas stacked on top of each other. This would result in the creation of a large, pyramid-shaped structure with six distinct layers each one slightly smaller than the previous. Work on this massive project started in Saqqara, next to the great enclosure built by Hazahemwe. Unlike previous mastabas, built with mud brick, Djoser's tomb covered the mud brick interior with a shell of quarried limestone blocks transported on a massive system of rollers. With a total volume of 330,000 cubic meters, the monument, now known as the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, was unprecedented in scale and splendor during its time of construction. Apparently, it was also incredibly well constructed, with the majority of the structure remaining intact to this day. I'll be posting pictures of the Steppe Pyramid, and all the other pyramids that we mentioned today, on our associated blog if you'd like to see it. The pyramid was surrounded by a large complex of necropolis buildings, where a small legion of priests would have conducted Djoser's funerary rites. The buildings in this complex are arranged facing north so that they could face the North Star. Stars were an important symbol in ancient Egyptian religion, as they were eternal, and thus facing the stars would allow the pharaoh to join these eternal symbols in the sky during the afterlife. When he eventually died, Djoser's body was buried in a deep maze of catacombs that stretched for over six kilometers. This labyrinthian complex was intentionally meant to be confusing, as to ensure that grave robbers would be unable to disturb Djoser's final resting place and rob him of his afterlife. <laughs>
Djoser died after a successful rule of 28 years. He and his wife, who was also a sister, of course, only produced one child, a daughter. Now, while women had held the position of pharaoh in the past, this was only ever in the context of acting as a temporary regent for their son, and never inherited the title as an heir. So, when Djoser died, he was left without a son to succeed him. In previous periods, this probably would have blown up in everyone's face, and resulted in an extended crisis and bloody civil war. However, attesting to the state of stability of Egypt at the time, is that rule passed peacefully to his brother, Djoser T. Djoser T was already fairly old when he took the throne, and therefore he only ruled for about six years. Little is known about the actual events that transpired during his reign. Interestingly, Djoser T, as well as his predecessor, had revived the practice of wearing the two crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt separately. Showing that while he ruled a united Egypt with absolute power, Djoser T still had to respect the autonomy of Upper and Lower Egypt, at least in a ceremonial sense. Most of Djoser T's reign can just be described as continuing the practice of his older brother. He was happy not to disrupt the status quo. After all, Egypt was in a good place economically and politically at the time of Djoser's death, so why try to fix what isn't broken? Imhotep likely outlived Djoser and continued to be a key advisor during the reign of Djoser T, as his architectural motifs remained present throughout the rule of Djoser T. When exactly Imhotep died is unclear, but this likely occurred sometime during the reign of Djoser T. After his death, Imhotep became the first ever non-royal Egyptian to become deified, worshipped as a minor god of medicine. The last project he may have been involved in was the Pyramid of Djoser T, a structure that resembled a near-exact copy of Djoser's pyramid, though with seven layers instead of six. However, unlike Djoser's pyramid, the Pyramid of Djoser T was never fully completed. The inner structure of mud brick, as well as the subterranean system of tunnels, were finished, but Djoser T died before the final limestone shell could be added to the pyramid. A pharaoh's successor was usually tasked with finishing the tomb of his predecessor, but it seems that in this case Djoser T's successor figured that the mostly finished structure was good enough as it is, and never needed to add the limestone shell. Apparently, however, this was a very incorrect assumption. The pyramid collapsed in on itself, and was left in ruins. The sands of the Egyptian desert later came in to reclaim this forgotten monument, and left it buried for thousands of years. Befitting the fate of such a tragic monument, the structure is still largely unexcavated today. If you'd like to learn about the strange manner of the excavation, involving a tragic suicide and some sketchy accusations of smuggling, that will be the topic of this week's premium episode, which you can access by supporting the show on Patreon. Anyways, Djoser T was succeeded by a man named Sanacht. Sanacht's relationship with Djoser T is unclear. Due to the shortness of his reign, however, we can assume that he took the throne at a relatively old age, implying that he was most likely the brother of Djoser and Djoser T. Sanacht, like Djoser T, was a close follower of the status quo, not doing much during his short reign to stand out from his brothers. Really, the only unusual thing about Sanacht's reign was Sanacht himself. Unlike his reign, Sanacht was not short, towering over his peers at 6 feet and 1 inches tall. That height isn't particularly impressive to us today, but for the time it was absolutely massive. Compared to the average height of the time, this is the equivalent of 6 feet and 8 inches tall. So, to an ancient Egyptian peasant, Sanacht's reign was like having LeBron James as king. Anyways, due to the shortness of his reign, Sanacht never had time to build himself a pyramid, instead settled on living his afterlife in a large mastaba built outside of Abydos. Sanacht was succeeded by his son, Huni, also known as Chava, the last pharaoh of the Third Dynasty. Huni enjoyed a rule of considerable length. He was the first pharaoh since Set Peribsen to considerably expand the bureaucracy, appointing a vizier and delegating much of his local authority to nomarchs. As with previous rulers, the decision to delegate power to the bureaucracy and local leaders increased the efficiency of the Egyptian state. Egypt enjoyed a long period of peace and prosperity under Huni's rule, with many large building projects being erected during his reign. 
One of these building projects was the expansion of a small rural settlement near the border of Upper and Lower Egypt into a major city, Hetneset. He also pursued a project of building small step pyramids throughout the gnomes of Upper Egypt. These micro-pyramids were not used as tombs, so their exact purpose remains a mystery, with the most popular theory being that they were used as places of worship. Huni also pursued a project of shoring up Egypt's defenses on its southern border. The southernmost major city of Egypt, Nahen, proved to be effective as a border city in stopping Nubian raids in the past. However, Egypt also controlled several small settlements south of Nahen until the first cataract, which the Egyptians had a hard time defending. Huni had to choose a new location further up the Nile to garrison Egyptian soldiers if these settlements were to be protected from Nubian raids. He chose a strategically important location just north of the first cataract, an island in the Nile River known as Elephantine, close to modern Aswan. Elephantine's geography made it difficult to attack from the land, and allowed the Egyptians to control what flowed up and down the Nile. Finally, in order to protect the already naturally defensible position, Huni commissioned the creation of a series of fortifications to protect the garrison at Elephantine. These forts would serve as the border between Egypt and Nubia throughout the Old Kingdom period. In the future, when relations between Egypt and Nubia focus less on raiding and more on trading, Elephantine would benefit from this economic shift and become a major center of trade on the Nile River. For now though, it would remain a small rural outpost which served as the end of Egyptian authority. Huni died in 2613 BC, after 24 successful years as pharaoh. He sought to imitate his ancestors of Djoser and djoser T with the creation of a step pyramid at Saqqara. The pyramid was more humble than those of his predecessors, smaller in height and width, with only five steps in its structure. However, it seems that, like djoser T, Huni had some difficulties finishing his tomb. The pyramid collapsed not long after its construction had been completed, and today more resembles a pile of rubble than a tomb fit for a king. So far, the Egyptian pharaohs are one for three when it comes to building pyramids, and as we'll see in the future, it will still take them a little while to improve in this regard. On a side note, I think that the trial and error that the Egyptians went through to learn how to build these marvelous monuments really shows off the human ingenuity that had to go into the creation. Building a pyramid with the technology available at the time wasn't just an easy thing to do as even a slight mistake in material used or dimensions built could result in the entire structure collapsing in on itself. To me, this makes the completed pyramids even more impressive, as it shows how flawless their design and construction had to be to stand the test of time. It also highlights that these pyramids were in fact built by humans with human error. So if you see someone on UFO forums or the History Channel say that the pyramids are too perfect to have been created by humans, you should tell them how these pyramids could only be successfully built after several failed pyramids showed them what mistakes to avoid. While Huni's reign was successful, he died without an heir, and with no living brothers to take the throne in his stead. He did have one child, however, a daughter named Hetaferes. His daughter married a nomarch from Khmunu, a city near the border of Upper and Lower Egypt, named Sneferu. Now, a son-in-law taking over as pharaoh was viewed as completely illegitimate, and in a less stable era it probably would have provoked a civil war, or at least a few rebellions. But in a testament to just how far Egypt had come since the Second Dynasty, Sneferu's ascent to the throne was largely uncontested. With Sneferu on the throne, the Third Dynasty came to an end and the 4th dynasty would somehow bring Egypt to even higher heights during this golden age. Join us next week, when Sneferu and his descendants rule the Old Kingdom during its absolute zenith, and build the Great Pyramids of Giza. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com by giving the show a review on iTunes or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we left off with the death of Huni, the last of the Third Dynasty pharaohs. 
However, Egypt was in a stable enough state when he died that Rule was able to pass on successfully to his son-in-law, Sneferu, when he couldn't produce a legitimate heir. This week, we'll see the Old Kingdom reach its absolute height, but we also see some of the warning signs of Egypt's inevitable fall from grace. Episode 8, The Old Kingdom's Peak When Sneferu took the throne in 2613 BC, he inherited an incredibly healthy economy and government. Beginning during the reign of Chazahemwe and continuing throughout the reign of his successors, Egypt experienced an extended period of economic success during the early Old Kingdom. As a result, pharaohs like Djoser, Djoser T, and Huni spent this wealth liberally, not just on their impressive tombs, but also on extensive building projects like temples, shrines, irrigation canals, and military fortifications. Sneferu, however, would take this construction mania to a whole new level. Throughout his impressive 48-year reign, Sneferu would complete the construction of not one, but three pyramids. The first of these massive monuments was the Pyramid of Meidum. The Meidum Pyramid was one of the most unusual monuments from ancient Egypt, and one of the more mysterious monuments in terms of its construction. Egyptologists generally agree that the project was completed during the reign of Sneferu. However, the pyramid was not meant for Sneferu, and was instead dedicated to his father-in-law, Huni. This fact has led Egyptologists to be divided on when the construction of the pyramid began. Some believe that the construction of this pyramid began during the late years of Huni's reign over Egypt, and that Sneferu simply completed the already mostly finished project. Others, however, believe that Huni had already died by the time that the pyramid's construction had began and that its construction was intended as a posthumous means to honor the old king. Regardless of who began construction, the Meidum Pyramid was incredibly innovative in its design. The pyramid consisted of two pieces, an internal step pyramid design and an external limestone shell. This was the design of the most famous pyramids that we know today, with no visible steps, and instead with smoothly upward sloping sides. Now, as we learned last episode, this wasn't the first pyramid to incorporate this two-piece design. The Buried Pyramid of Djoser T and the Layer Pyramid of Huni each incorporated this design, but each of these pyramids were unfinished or collapsed soon after their construction. The Pyramid at Meidum was the first of these limestone-covered pyramids to stand the test of time, sort of. The pyramid stood tall as a successful monument to Huni throughout the majority of ancient Egyptian history. However, Sometime around the 11th century BC, a millennium and a half after its construction, a problem started to occur. You see, while the internal pyramid structure was built on a solid surface, the edges of the limestone shell had been built on slightly softer, siltier land. The difference wasn't substantial at first, as the difference in ground texture was not that severe. However, the shell slowly slid into the surface over the centuries, collapsing at the bottom into a pile of rubble. Today, the pyramid is one of the most interesting structures from ancient Egypt that remains today. In the middle of the pyramid, there exists mostly still intact remains of the internal step pyramid structure, while a pile of shattered limestone sits around the base. This gives the remaining structure a picturesque appearance of a sort of grim tower, rising from the remains of the once grand pyramid. Pictures of this unique structure will be posted on the podcast blog if you would like to see the pyramid for yourself. So, why did the visual style of pyramids transition from the step design to the more famous slope design? The explanation is likely a change in ideology. You see, part of the symbolism of the step pyramids was its status as multiple mastabas tacked on top of each other. However, as Egypt's economy continued to develop into a more sophisticated system and the kingdom's labor force grew with the population, mastabas grew increasingly commonplace. While commoners still couldn't afford the resources required to build more mastabas, most nomarchs, important government officials, and royal family members had a personal mastaba at their gravesite. As mastabas became more common, their status as an icon of royal power faded. The imagery of stacked mastabas thus lost some of its luster. An alternative theory is that there was a shift in theological understanding among the Egyptian priestly class at this point. The step pyramids also held a symbolic significance of representing a stairway to the stars for the king to climb after his death. But a theological shift placed an increased importance on the sun instead of on the night sky. And new pyramids were designed to serve as a symbolic representation of the wellspring of life rather than as a set of heavenly stairs. Sneferu, since he took the throne, had one ambition on his mind, 
While his rule had never been challenged militarily, and nobody would dare say it in his presence, I'm sure that questions of his legitimacy ran rampant throughout the royal court and bureaucracy. I mean, this guy is claiming to be the god king that speaks for Horus. But I heard he's just some nomarch who married the last guy's daughter. What's up with that? It seems that these questions really struck a nerve with Seferu, even developing into something of a complex. He set out to construct the most impressive project in not just Egyptian, but human history to that point. This, more than anything else, would unquestionably demonstrate his divine power. Rather than just one pyramid, Sneferu would build two, and each of these would surpass all previous monuments in size and scale. The site at which these enormous pyramids would be constructed was marked to be at Dakhshur, a site just south of Saqqara. Construction began in 2600 BC, as Sneferu hired swarms of artisans and laborers to begin work on the construction of these two grand pyramids. Yes, you heard that right, hired. Contrary to popular belief, the pyramids were not built by slaves, but were instead built by well-compensated and respected artisans and laborers. In fact, the evidence for any general widespread practice of slavery in Old Kingdom Egypt is pretty sparse, and the first accepted evidence for Egyptian slavery comes from the New Kingdom period, more than a thousand years later. However, while the labor force for the pyramids was assembled successfully, the construction process quickly ran into a major problem. Egypt lacked any major sources of timber, and thus a wood shortage quickly ground construction to a halt. Sneferu, wanting to resume work as soon as possible, launched a series of devastating raids past Elephantine and into Nubia, looting the abundant timber from the region. He also increased the exploitation of the copper mines in the Sinai, ensuring that the extraction of the metal and production of tools with it remained untouched, and raided the arid coast of Libya to the west for cattle to feed and clothe his army of laborers. Copper and cattle were transported by caravan across the desert, while massive barges carrying Nubian timber gently floated down the Nile. Once they arrived in Dakhshur, these materials were processed and distributed among the workers, fueling this enormous building project. In a sense, Sneferu had created the world's first true supply chain. It took decades, but by the end of Sneferu's reign, two massive pyramids at Dakhshur were complete. Each towering at 105 meters of height, either of these monuments was large enough to tower over the largest buildings in the world at the time. Coated in a sleek polish of white limestone, they stood in the sands of Dakhshur as monuments to the unquestionable divine power of King Sneferu. Let's take a minute to look at each of these buildings a little more closely. The first of these pyramids is known as the Bent Pyramid, due to its unusual shape. The pyramid shape starts ascending at an unusually steep 54 degree angle, but then halfway up begins sloping at a gentler 44 degree angle instead. This gives the pyramid the unusual shape from which it derives its name. The debate as to why the pyramid was built in this unusual shape has transpired really since the creation of Egyptology as a field of study. Scholars believed for a long time that the sharp ascent of the pyramid's angle risked a collapse, and that the angle was lowered partway through the construction process to compensate. Others believed that the pyramid's angle was instead lowered because Sneferu died during the construction process, and that lowering the angle of ascent allowed the pyramid to be finished faster. However, recent research from the Journal for the History of Astronomy has made a compelling alternative claim. Rather than its unique shape deriving from an accident, this research argues that the Bent Pyramid was built with its inconsistent angles to align with the angle of a sunset during the winter solstice. Additionally, the Bent Pyramid is built to symbolize the conical crown of Upper Egypt, corresponding with the fact that it was the southernmost built monument of the pair. Sneferu's other pyramid built at Dakhshur is known as the Red Pyramid, due to its unusually red limestone used in the construction of its core. The pyramid ascends at a 44 degree angle, except for at the very tip. The tip featured a pyramidion, or a capstone that would cover the tip of the pyramid, that ascended at a 45 degree angle. This piece of architectural symmetry between the pyramids further compels the theory that the Bent Pyramid's unusual shape was intentional, meant to be an opposite reflection of the Red Pyramid. The Red Pyramid was meant to represent the Red Crown of Lower Egypt, and was thus positioned in the north. Sneferu, after decades spent organizing the construction of this magnificent tomb to secure his symbolic legitimacy, died after 48 years of rule. Apparently, this project was a success, as his eldest son, Khufu, ascended to the throne upon his father's death. Khufu is most well known for one thing, really, the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza, 
This astronomically large monument surpassed all other man-made structures on Earth in terms of size and volume, and would even remain the tallest structure in the world ever built until, get this, 1311 AD, when the Lincoln Cathedral in England just barely surpassed its height. Regardless, you already know about the Great Pyramid, because who doesn't, so I don't feel the need to discuss it any further. Just know that this is the peak in the scale of Egyptian monument building, and that Khufu's pyramid remains the largest Egyptian pyramid ever built. What is less well known about is Khufu's reign beyond his magnificent monument, with the closest source we have to go off being Manetho's statement that Khufu, quote, earned the contempt of the gods, unquote, and whatever that means. Maybe this indicates a famine or especially bad natural disaster during his reign, but nobody really knows. One of the few political events that we have any knowledge of is that, apparently, his predecessor's mine in the Sinai began to slow their yields during Khufu's reign, and he ordered a new expedition to uncover new mines, which they did. Apparently, he also invested heavily in the creation of a series of Egyptian maritime settlements on the Red Sea. Other than that, the man's life is an enigma. He died after a reign of 23 years. Khufu was succeeded by his son, Jedifre. Jedifre, like his father, is largely a mystery. He ruled for only 11 years, and as a result, opted for a strategy of quality over quantity in terms of the construction of his tomb. While it was small, far smaller than even the old Pyramid of Djoser, it was composed of incredibly beautiful materials, such as imported granite, rather than the usual limestone, and featured an oversized and likely ornately decorated Pyramidian at its summit. Due to his early death, Jedifre left no heir to the throne. Instead, the throne was passed to his brother, Khafra. Khafra's position in the historical records is incredibly similar to that of his father. He's known primarily for the construction of the second largest pyramid at Giza, and the famous statue of the Sphinx that you always see in Egyptian travel guides. What the appearance of such a mythological creature means is puzzling. This statue is the first ever depiction of a Sphinx in art or writing, and so what exactly it was meant to represent is something of a mystery. The Sphinx was a common creature throughout Eastern Mediterranean mythology, most likely originating in pre-dynastic Egypt. The mainstream conception of the Sphinx as a creature of riddles and mystery that pervades the pop culture of the West is derived primarily from Greek myth rather than from Egypt. Some Egyptologists speculate that the Sphinx was somehow related to Egypt's cult of the sun that was growing in popularity during this era of the Old Kingdom, or that perhaps it was meant to serve as a guardian of the pharaohs after their death. Even the face of the Sphinx itself remains something of a mystery. While most scholars believe that the face of the Sphinx represents Khafra himself, a few heretics within the field claim that it was, in fact, added long after Khafra's death and depicts a later pharaoh. Khafra's son, Menkare, ascended to the throne after his father's death. If you're sensing a trend, little is known about his reign beyond the monuments he built. But the most well-known of these monuments is his pyramid, the smallest of the main pyramids at the complex of Giza. One of the few things known about Menkare's rule is that he was a generous patron of the arts, sponsoring some of the most impressive statues and busts yet made by humanity. These statues, carved of black sandstone, depict an idealized portrait of Menkare and his wife, each embodying the ideal male and female forms from the Egyptian perspective. Other similarly styled statues show him flanked by the goddesses Hathor and Bat, two of the most important fertility goddesses from this period. These statues show the way that the pharaoh wanted to depict himself, as an intermediary between the mortal and heavenly worlds, a line of communication between gods and man. Menkare died after just 11 years on the throne. Due to his short reign, Menkare's pyramid was unfinished when he vacated the throne. Therefore, the responsibility to finish his tomb fell on his son, Shepsechaf. Shepsechaf enjoyed only a four-year rule, incredibly short by the standards of Egyptian pharaohs, and spent most of his time arduously trying to complete his father's pyramid. As a result, he had no time to focus on his own tomb, and was instead buried at a mastaba in Saqqara, in what was likely an unwanted return to tradition. Mankare had no legitimate children from his first wife, and so after his death in 2506 BC, rule passed to his illegitimate son, Uzerkov, marking the end of Egypt's fourth dynasty. So, before I sign off this week, I want to reflect a little. I mean, what was the point of this episode? Was it just listing off pyramids and names? Well, unfortunately, due to the poor records of the time, this is really all we have to go off. I worry that this episode will end up looking like the Book of Numbers in podcast form, 
you know, Sneferu begat Khufu, Khufu begat Jedifrey, etc, etc. However, I do feel like there are some key takeaways from this episode that can aid our understanding of Egyptian history. In terms of the absolute wealth and power of the pharaohs, the fourth dynasty period would unquestionably be the apex until at least the new kingdom, a millennium later. Nothing in later periods would even come close to the size and splendor of the fourth dynasty, indicating that, most likely, later pharaohs simply didn't command enough resources to take on such immense projects. However, you may have noticed a slightly troubling trend while I was talking about the pharaohs. We started with Sneferu, who commanded enough resources to build not one, but three impressive pyramids, then Khufu, who built one especially massive and impressive pyramid, and then eventually followed by increasingly small, underwhelming structures throughout the rest of the dynasty's reign. So, what was going on that caused this trend? I suspect that Egypt's economy slowly declined during the back half of the fourth dynasty, not quickly or suddenly enough for anyone to notice, but rather very gradually. There was never a moment in which this crisis culminated, but every year, Egypt's available labor force would slightly shrink, the productivity would decrease, and the capability to build massive monuments would decline with it. My personal suspicion is that years of spending exorbitant amounts of resources on massive pyramids was starting to take its toll on the Egyptian economy. Each laborer being used on a projection of pharaonic power was not being used on irrigation projects, ports, or mining infrastructure that would better serve Egypt in the long term of material development. This lack of investment didn't have any immediate consequences, but over time, the old eroding irrigation system started to cause trouble for the Egyptian economy. As crop yields slowly became less impressive, more laborers had to dedicate time to feeding their family instead of working on massive state monuments. Egypt was certainly still in a state of prosperity, but warning signs were beginning to appear that this prosperity was not to last. Join us next week to see Egypt's golden age continue but for how much longer? Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we witnessed the Fourth Dynasty rule as the apex of Egyptian power. We left off with Egypt's economy gradually declining, but remaining healthy overall, when the first pharaoh of the Fifth Dynasty, Uzerkoff, took the throne. With that said, let's jump right in. Episode 9, The Rise of the Cult of Ra. So, during the last episode, I mentioned something in an offhanded comment and then realized that I totally should have elaborated on it further. That was, how the shift from step pyramids to smooth-sided pyramids came from a change in religious ideology of the Egyptian state. The new smooth pyramid sought to associate these pharaoh's tombs with the rising solar cult. But what exactly is this solar cult? So, as we've learned in previous episodes, religious controversy was not an uncommon thing in ancient Egypt. Before Narmer united the region, most cities just worshipped their local protector gods, and when Narmer united Egypt, he united these disparate and sometimes contradictory gods into one pantheon. But due to the cobbled together nature of this pantheon, its hierarchy wasn't really clear, and the religion was still based on primarily local grounds, with cities worshipping their locally associated god before all others. Egypt later went through a major religious conflict during the late Second Dynasty with Upper Egyptian kings forsaking Horus in favor of Set as their most important god. However, in the late Second Dynasty, a new religious faction began to rise surrounding a minor solar deity called Ra. The theological origins of Ra are unclear to say the least, but because his worship centered primarily around the city of Iyunu in Lower Egypt, this strongly implies that the belief in Ra originated there. The character of this cult of Ra is largely unknown, while the term cult conjures up imagery of shadow priests or poison Kool-Aid, in ancient Egypt a cult just referred to a small following of dedicated worshippers. Ra's cult spread rapidly throughout Lower Egypt during the reign of Khazakhemwe, and continued to spread at this quick pace during the Third Dynasty. By the end of the Third Dynasty, the cult was well established throughout the entirety of the Egyptian kingdom. By this time, the role of Ra had transformed within the minds of his creators. He was no longer just a sun god, 
but was the self-created progenitor of all things in the universe. How mainstream Egyptian society initially responded to this growing cult is unclear. What is clear, though, is that by the time of the Fourth Dynasty, the cult of Ra now was the mainstream. Pharaohs began building their tombs in a way that conformed to solar worship, and, starting with Jedifra, even began claiming to be the direct descendants of Ra himself. So, why am I talking about this now, instead of last episode? Well, while the cult of Ra was already influential on the pharaohs during the Fourth Dynasty, the Fifth Dynasty pharaohs would really take this veneration to a whole new level. The first pharaoh of the Fifth Dynasty, Uzerkoth, was the illegitimate son of Shepsekoth, the last pharaoh of the Fourth Dynasty. He was already a grown man when his father died with no legitimate heirs, and so he ascended to the throne. While there was nothing resembling of an outbreak of civil war, Uzerkoth's position on the throne was incredibly unsafe. Countless rivals from the dynastic family, ambitious members of the bureaucracy, and the powerful priestly class were well aware of the illegitimacy of Uzerkov's snatching of royal authority. While nobody would dare openly question the pharaoh's authority, Uzerkov's rivals schemed in the shadows regarding how to best topple him. Like Sneferu before him, Uzerkov had to find a way to strengthen his legitimacy to secure his spot on the throne. The first way he did this was by marrying his stepmother slash aunt, Hew, Khentkos which further tied him into the lineage of the previous pharaohs. This is, of course, not too unusual in Egyptian history, as inbreeding was the norm in royal marriages. The family of the Fourth Dynasty was still a powerful force in the Egyptian state, and marrying into this family would quiet potential enemies from within the dynastic court. Seeing that Uzerkov's position was growing more secure, his dynastic rivals and their supporters fled into the deserts of Libya. With his rivals within the royal family pacified or in exile, Uzerkov still needed to ensure that he could find a base of support among the mainstream public, which he found within the powerful cult of Ra. By the time Uzerkov took the throne, the cult of Ra was the most influential cult in the Egyptian kingdom. Recognizing the influence held by the cult, Uzerkov tried to endear himself with its leadership. While previous pharaohs provided mere lip service to this growing religion, Uzerkov proclaimed the cult to be the new hegemonic state religion. While cults surrounding the worship of other gods were allowed to continue, they could only do so in a way that made them clearly subservient to the cult of Ra. Instead of funneling exorbitant resources towards the construction of magnificent tombs like his ancestors, Uzerkov instead funneled these resources into the construction of a massive solar temple. He chose Abusir, an empty site north of Memphis, to be the site of his grand temple and construction began in the fifth year of his reign. During its heyday, the temple must have been something to behold. It was known as Nechend Ra, or Ra's Fortress, composed of two sections, an upper temple, which sat atop a hill, and a valley temple. During service each night, the priests would wait until they saw certain constellations arise from the horizon, and then descend from the upper temple down to the valley temple, where they would sacrifice two geese and two cattle as offerings to Ra. Nechan Ra was built of polished limestone, granite, and diorite, the most expensive building materials available at the time. Like Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park, Uzerkov spared no expense. Regardless of if Uzerkov was a true believer in the cult or was just cynically using them to secure support, the cult's influence and wealth expanded immensely under his reign. He granted them tens of thousands of acres of agricultural estates, appointed several priests of the cult to positions within the royal bureaucracy, and showered them with silver from the royal treasury. Priests of the cult of Ra commissioned impressive tombs for themselves, and enjoyed material wealth only surpassed by the fortune of the royal family itself. With the loyalty of the cult ensured, Uzerkov had finally secured a base of support large enough to ensure his security on the throne. Now he could finally begin to rule like a normal pharaoh. In response to a rise of an early form of piracy on the Mediterranean, Uzerkov saw a massive expansion of Egypt's naval capabilities, this naval expansion opened the door to a massive increase in maritime trade. During his reign, we have our first evidence of contact between the Greek and Egyptian worlds, with trade contact being established between the Egyptians and Minoan peoples of ancient Crete. Additionally, he led a military expedition into Libya to find and punish those who had opposed his reign, as well as to collect tribute in the form of cattle from the Libyan tribes. Despite the massive impact of his reign in Egyptian history, it was a short one as Uzerkov ruled for only eight years. In a return to tradition, Uzerkov ordered the construction of his tomb in Saqqara. Whether due to his short reign or his focus on spending resources on solar temples, 
Uzerkov's pyramid is humble compared to those of his predecessors, only about half the size of Djoser's original step pyramid. While the pyramid remained intact for hundreds of years, it was eventually harvested for building materials, which caused its collapse. Today, the pyramid resembles a small pile of disheveled stones, unfit for such an impactful ruler. When Uzerkov died, his heir, a boy named Sakura, meaning he who is close to Ra, took the throne after a brief regency by his mother. Upon assuming the throne, Sahura, like his father, took a keen interest in the Egyptian navy. He continued expanding the Egyptian fleet, both in the Mediterranean and Red Seas, ordering expeditions to the northern Canaanite lands of modern Lebanon, and south to the land of Punt in the modern nations of Ethiopia and Somalia. These expeditions established trade routes that would provide Egypt with many important luxury goods in the future, like electrum, ebony wood, ivory, and incenses from Punt as well as cedar trees from northern Canaan. Apparently, the ship even carried back a group of 12 Syrian brown bears and paraded them around the streets of Memphis as a fascinating curiosity. He also continued his father's religious policies and further expanded the power of, of the ever more influential cult of Ra. Sahura's reign was internally peaceful, with no rebellions occurring against his reign within Egypt. Externally, however, Sahara's reign was plagued with foreign wars. First, the Sinai Peninsula, the ever-important source of most of Egypt's copper, rose in rebellion. Encouraged by this defiance of Egyptian authority, the Berber nomads and city-states of the Libyan desert also decided to stop sending tribute. And, as if this wasn't bad enough, the Nile Delta was attacked in a series of especially bad pirate raids the same year. Fortunately, the building up of the Egyptian navy paid off, and Sahara was able to fight off these maritime raiders with relative ease. He then successfully destroyed the rebellious tribes within the Sinai, before turning his attention to Libya. The Libyans proved more difficult to subdue, but were ultimately brought back to subservience after years of conflict. It appears that Egyptian forces took out their anger from this prolonged war on the Libyans, ransacking the region for all it was worth. The army slowly slogged its way back to Egypt across the desert with an unprecedentedly large horde of livestock tribute in tow. To ensure that the Libyans wouldn't get any ideas again in the future, Sahara ordered the creation of a new settlement in the western delta region, known as Hutjewut. This settlement was built to act as a military garrison, if war with the Libyans ever broke out again. His subjugation of the Libyans would be one of Sahara's proudest achievements. On the wall of his funerary temple, there is a mural depicting Sahara conversing with the god Ash, the deity of oases and the god associated with the deserts of Libya. The god praises Sahara for his accomplishments. I give to you all that is within Libya. I give you all hostile peoples with all the provisions within their foreign lands. I grant thee all western and eastern lands with all the savage bowmen within and throughout the world. As well as his accomplishments in war, Sahara was also an accomplished ruler in statecraft. He promoted a new position within the bureaucracy, the overseer of the western desert, to ensure a smooth and stable collection of tribute from Libya in the future. In fact, Sahara oversaw a large expansion of the bureaucracy more generally, but, unlike previous pharaohs, practiced a system of relative meritocracy. Instead of promoting members of the royal family to positions of bureaucracy, he would instead promote commoners and nobles who were, get this, actually good at their jobs. This relatively meritocratic system was far more effective than the previous system, where you would withhold power only to your mostly incompetent relatives, and the efficiency of the Egyptian government flourished as a result. Throughout his reign, Sahara was truly viewed as the conqueror of the world and as a great king. His reign did not last especially long, only 12 years. However, Sahura made a lasting impression on the people of Egypt, and continued to be worshipped long after his death, with his status as a popular deity lasting well into the New Kingdom period, thousands of years later. And it's easy to see why. Sahara is one of those undeniably effective pharaohs who was pretty easy to take a liking to. Apparently, he was a kind ruler to his own people, but also a fierce martial king when the time for war came. He was a great conqueror, yet a responsible statesman who implemented effective bureaucratic reforms. He was an ambitious monument builder, but also didn't forget about the importance of cultivating trade and economic growth. Truly, he was everything to everyone. He was laid to rest in Abu Sir, in a relatively humble pyramid like his father. Sahara was succeeded to the throne by his eldest son, Nefir Kara. Throughout his ten-year reign, Egypt enjoyed a period of peace and stability, 
honestly, with regards to his rule, there is very little to tell about, as he remains somewhat enigmatic in historical records. But what little we do know about him paints him as an especially benevolent ruler. This is evidenced by a contemporary story involving how he treated his royal court. So, the story goes that there's this guy named Rawr. Rawr is a bureaucrat who is quite elderly by this point, being a veteran official who was also present during the reign of Sakura. He was likely a royal stylist, or some other position close to the pharaoh. Anyways, so Rawr is attending one of the countless royal ceremonies that occur nearly constantly in the palace at Memphis. He walks past Neferkari, who is holding a royal mace, and slips embarrassingly. No big deal, we've all been there, right? Well, wrong. When Rawr slips, he falls directly on to Neferkara and ends up knocking down the pharaoh, and even ends up touching the royal mace. Now, keep in mind that Neferkara isn't just some guy. He's the freaking son of Ra, a living god, and Rawr just slipped onto him like he's in a slapstick comedy. And if that's not bad enough, he touched the royal mace. This is like the ancient Egyptian equivalent of burning the Quran in front of God himself. So, under normal circumstances, that's it. Nice knowing you, Rawr. Hope you enjoy your painful execution. I mean, people have been beheaded for way less. But Neferirkara stands up and basically just says, I hope you're okay, and then moves on. Apparently, during another one of these ceremonies, Neferirkara's vizier suffered from a heat stroke. Instead of just continuing the ceremony like nothing was happening, as was customary, Neferirkara springs into action and immediately summons his royal physician to help the vizier. Now, from our modern perspective, neither of these actions sound particularly unusual. Like, wow, you didn't let your advisor die from heatstroke or execute an old man for falling onto you by accident. You want a medal? But, keep in mind, this was genuinely unusual for Egyptian royalty. Pharaohs are raised, usually from birth, to believe themselves to be literal deities. They're surrounded at all times by sycophantic advisors who constantly praise them and say that they can do no wrong, and heap never-ending praise upon their every decision. Honestly, if this was my upbringing, I'd probably be narcissistic enough to let a guy die of heatstroke too. So, we've been talking a lot about which pharaohs were effective or ineffective rulers throughout the podcast, but for the first time, I can confidently say that Neferirkari is the first pharaoh who actually sounds like a decent guy. Anyways, in addition to being a pretty chill dude, apparently Neferirkari was also a fairly effective ruler, with his decade of rule being a time of economic growth for Egypt. In a return to tradition, Neferirkari wanted to be buried in a step pyramid like that of Djoser. However, he unfortunately died before his tomb could be completed, and the remaining structure is largely in ruins today. Neferirkara's son, Neferira, is barely worth noting. He ascended to the throne, and then immediately died within the first two years. An enigmatic man named Shepsakara took the throne. Contemporary sources on this pharaoh are practically non-existent, with his relation to the royal family being incredibly unclear. Some believe that he was a usurper who seized the throne after a brief period of conflict following Neferira's death, but it is more likely that Shepsakara was either the king's uncle or an influential advisor, who served as regent until the next in line of the throne, a boy named Nusera, was old enough to rule in his own right. I personally buy into this theory, as there is little to no evidence of military conflict in Egypt during this time. Regardless of how he came to power or who he was, Shepsakara's role in Egyptian history is nearly non-existent, as most of his projects went unfinished by the end of his seven-year reign. Nusera was the next pharaoh to rise to power. Nusera enjoyed a long reign, ruling for more than three decades, but accomplished little. He was a rather ineffectual, if inoffensive, ruler, focusing most of his energy on the ceremonial duties of the pharaoh, rather than on the material responsibilities of ruling a kingdom. However, with his inaction, Nusera refused to act on a growing crisis within the Egyptian state. You see, during the seven years of regency that preceded him, the throne of Egypt was essentially empty. As a result, most of the actual work of administration was done by the bureaucracy, local government, and priesthood. When Nusera rose to power, the newfound influence of these classes was something that needed to be wrangled in as had happened under the earlier pharaohs of the dynasty. However, Nusera did nothing, and instead allowed this power to expand unchecked. The only projects that Nusera seemed concerned about were that of the construction of solar temples, and the construction of his own tomb. Infrastructure, trade, irrigation, all were left to the bureaucracy to handle it. Nusera was very popular during his time as pharaoh, and was even extensively worshipped after his death. But ultimately, his reign accomplished nothing but the undermining of royal authority. 
After more than 30 years on the throne, Nusra was buried at Abusir. His brother, Menkahor, succeeded Nusra to the throne. His reign is not especially well attested to, but from what little is known, he seems to have continued the policies of his brother. After eight uneventful years on the throne, he died, and rule passed on to his son, Jedkara. Unlike his successors, Jedkara would not sit idly by as an inoffensive and ineffective ruler. Instead, he would do something far worse. Upon ascending to the throne, Jedkara inherited an Egypt where royal authority was rapidly declining. By this point, while the pharaoh was still the uncontested spiritual leader of Egypt, much of the material power of the kingdom was in the hands of the bureaucrats. Now, unlike his predecessors, Jedkara recognized that this was a problem, and decided that action was necessary to reverse this trend. He set out an ambitious plan of civil and religious reforms that he thought would permanently weaken the power of the royal bureaucracy in the cult of Ra, and restore his absolute power in the process. The first of these reforms was straightforward. Jedkara abandoned the dynasty's ties with the cult of Ra. The partnership with the cult of Ra and the fifth dynasty pharaohs was initially mutually beneficial. The cult gave its support to Uzerkov, and in exchange he gave the cult resources and influence. Jedkare, though, figured that this partnership had outlived its usefulness. After all, Uzerkov had risen to the throne decades ago, and the fifth dynasty's place on the throne was now secure. If anything, the solar cult was now just a parasite on the state, and was becoming a threat to the pharaohs itself. So, to undermine the influence of the established religion, Jedkara challenged the cult's authority, and shifted the favor of the royal dynasty to the growing, yet much smaller, cult of Osiris, god of the dead. If you've been listening for a long time, you might remember that Osiris originated as the patron deity of Abydos. Unlike the cult of Ra, which was based in Iyunu, just up the road from Memphis, the cult of Osiris was still based in Abydos, which was all the way down the Nile, which limited their potential influence in the capital. Now, this initially seems like a pretty good idea. Replace the cult that is threatening your power with a much weaker and further away alternative. However, this decision quickly became a problem. For one, with the choice of Osiris, the god of the dead, as the new main god of Egypt, Jedkara strongly reduced the theological role held by the pharaoh. By choosing a god so closely associated with the afterlife, Jedkara weakened the role of the pharaoh as the guarantor of afterlife, and thus removed much of the pharaoh's theological prestige. After all, why should I pray to and worship the pharaoh anyways? Osiris is the one who ultimately gave me an afterlife, not the pharaoh, so why not just pray directly to him? Additionally, while shifting the center of religion away from Memphis was part of the goal, this ended up backfiring immensely on Jed Kara. While this decision had reduced the influence of religious institutions on the pharaoh, it also made it harder for the pharaoh to associate himself with the religion through the regular practice of rituals, conducting of sacrifices, and building of temples in Egypt's holiest city, as that city was now hundreds of miles further away. Oops. As if the weakening of the pharaoh's religious authority wasn't enough, Jedkara also decided to implement a series of ill-conceived state reforms. Like his religious reforms, Jedkara's plan to reform the bureaucracy makes sense in an abstract sense. It was meant to address a problem which was very real, that being the rapid expansion of the power of royal bureaucrats. The first of these reformed was the undoing of the meritocratic system established by Sakura, replacing it with the old system of royal family members holding the most important positions within the bureaucracy. While the idea is that this will increase the loyalty of these bureaucrats through blood ties, the unintended result was that competent government officials were replaced with incompetent officials with family ties. This reduced the efficiency of the bureaucracy, meaning that even more officials had to be hired to compensate for this loss of efficiency. So far, this reform to weaken the bureaucracy has just increased the number of people within the bureaucracy, and thus made it harder for the pharaoh to control. Good job. So, the last reform was a bit of a swing and a miss. How about we try to reduce the power of lower-level royal bureaucrats as well? These lower-level bureaucrats had quickly become a growing center of power in the Egyptian state, often holding multiple titles and offices at a time. Jedkara figured that if he could weaken the power of these officials, this would concentrate more power within the vizier at the top of the bureaucratic hierarchy, which would make it easier for the pharaoh to manage. He prohibited the practice of lower officials holding more than one title at a time, which worked. Yes, the power of these lower officials was severely weakened. However, this didn't really increase the power of the pharaoh as much as it increased the power of local nomarchs. 
So, if anything, this just moved power from the hard-to-control lower royal officials to the even harder-to-control local governors. So, all of Jedkara's reforms have failed so far, and have done the exact opposite of their goal. Rather than strengthening royal power, they have, if anything, weakened it even more. Jedkara spent the next three decades continuing to try and fail to restore his royal power, and usually continued to make the problem worse in the process. After 33 disastrous years on the throne, he passed away and was buried in a pyramid complex in southern Sakura. He left the now significantly weaker throne to his son, Unas. So, before we talk about Unas, I want to give a super quick, oversimplified summary of an economic concept called economies of scale. So, in super basic, tremendously oversimplified terms, economies of scale is the principle that, due to myriad factors, as the scale of an economic operation grows, the efficiency with which it operates will increase. So, how is this relevant to Egypt? Well, Egypt decentralized rapidly under Jedkara's reign, with nomarchs enjoying an unprecedented amount of power while the power of the king shrunk tremendously. And, as Egypt decentralized, so too did its economic operations, like farming, construction, irrigation, and trade. The responsibility of managing these projects, once entrusted to Egypt's royal government, was now meant to be fulfilled by local nomarchs who commanded much smaller labor forces. As Unas took the throne, he inherited a kingdom whose economy was rapidly disintegrating. And what, however, while Egypt's economic fortunes were heading for the worst, the royal treasury was still full of silver from previous periods of wealth. Unas pumped this money into myriad building projects, giving the impression that everything was fine. While the economic toxin was present in Egypt's system, it wasn't showing symptoms yet. Sure, the efficiency of labor on essential infrastructure project was going down the tubes, but the king could still import limestone for his building projects. Incense was still coming from Punt, copper from Sinai, and cedar from Canaan. He could still afford to raise armies to send into Nubia to collect tribute. Nothing to worry about. Unlike his father, Unas did not attempt desperate, disastrous reforms, but instead took the path of the earlier pharaohs by ignoring the problem altogether. Instead, he focused his effort on the continual fight to establish the cult of Osiris as Egypt's new state religion, a task in which he was pretty successful. He tried to reconcile the new cult with the old cult of Ra by establishing that both gods played an important role in entering the afterlife. Unas's reign lasted for an impressive 30 years, but little was accomplished in material terms during this long reign. In fact, this long reign was, if anything, a disservice to Unas, as his son passed away shortly before Unas himself died, bringing an end to Egypt's fifth dynasty. The throne of Egypt was empty. However, the average Egyptian likely would have never even noticed. Throughout Unas's 30 years of rule, the power of the pharaoh had declined so rapidly that, outside of ceremonial purposes, he practically didn't do anything. If you're an Egyptian peasant, the goings-on within the royal palace essentially didn't affect you at all anymore. The royal officials who had once overseen work on canals, roads, and building projects were long gone, and in their place was the local government. However, no matter how ineffective it is in practice, an empty throne is still a tempting prize, and the outbreak of civil war is now an inevitability. Join us next week, as things somehow get even worse. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This modern world of science and invention is of particular interest to women. I'm Lexi. I'm Haley. And I'm Alana. And we're covering the good, the bad, and the ugly of women's history. Tune in to Lady History every Thursday to hear about different ladies across history and cultures, from astronauts to zoologists. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Lady History Pod, and find us wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we left off with the Old Kingdom reeling from a series of devastating failed reforms by the pharaoh Jedkara. Then, the last king of the Fifth Dynasty, Unas, died without an heir, leading Egypt into a period of dynastic chaos. Now, let's see what follows. Episode 10, The Fall of the Old Kingdom. <laughs>
To say that Egypt fell into a civil war after Unas's death in 2315 BC is something of an understatement. The chaos that ensued resembled a civil war, but not in the traditional sense of two sides fighting against each other. No, this was a civil war in the Syrian style, with dozens of local factions struggling for control. Unas's presence and the remaining wealth of the pharaohs kept the increasingly powerful nomarchs, or local governors, in check. If two nomarchs had a dispute, Unas could enforce peace between two rivals. But, with Unas dead, and with no immediate successor ready to take the throne, the floodgates were open. The proverbial bottle had been shaken by decades of decline in economic wealth, government decentralization, and religious unrest. And with Unas's death, the cap came off. The existing disputes between nomarchs over things like access to water and farmland quickly escalated into hundreds of local skirmishes, with cities leading small armies of conscripted peasants against each other into bloody forays. The throne of Egypt was unable to resolve these conflicts because, well, it was empty. The royal bureaucracy sat paralyzed, unable to deal with the disintegration of order. They commanded immense wealth of their own, but they couldn't just go out there and stop these uprisings. So, their attention was focused on finding a new candidate to sit on the throne. This was no easy matter, though as each bureaucrat had their own personal favorite choice, and wouldn't stand to see their rivals within the court appoint a puppet of their own. While these bureaucrats squabbled, Egypt continued to burn. But, after years of fighting, backstabbing, and palace coups, one faction ultimately won out. This faction was led by a triumvirate of important people within the royal palace. The first of these people was Unas's daughter, the royal princess Iput. The second, Senejamid, was an elder statesman who was Unas's most trusted advisor. Finally, there was Mehi, leader of the palace guard. Through a combination of force and personality, and, well, force, this triumvirate of power managed to place their favorite candidate on the throne. Egypt's new pharaoh would be Teti, the husband of Princess Iput. Now, how much power Teti actually commanded is questionable, and there is some compelling evidence that, in reality, he never held much power at all. Rather, he was practically a puppet for the three people responsible for his spot on the throne. But no matter how weak he was, just the undisputed presence of someone on the throne was enough to bring the country back to a state of relative peace. No marks could no longer freely wage war on each other, as they would face swift reprival from the royal palace. Teddy took the royal name Sehetepui, meaning he who pacifies the land. Egypt's internal warfare was over, for now, but its problems were just beginning. The pacification of Egypt led to a brief period of stability early in Teddy's rule. But, not long after Egypt's civil conflict ended, Senegamid died. This was unusual, and not unexpected, as Senegamid was already an old man by the time that Teddy took the throne. But, this now left just two people as the true power behind Teddy's throne. And just because they had managed to put Teddy on the throne together, that didn't mean that they were friends. It seems that Mehi's alliance with Iput was merely one of convenience, and that his loyalty was constantly in question. Senegamid had functioned as something of a balancing force between the princess and the royal guard, alleviating disputes between the two factions. But, with him dead, conflict was now inevitable. Mehi went out of his way to interfere greatly with the affairs of the royal family, he vastly increased the presence of guards within the palace, often firing palace servants and insisting that the royal family use guards loyal to him as replacements. These new servant guards were, in reality, thinly veiled spies, meant to ensure that the royal family wouldn't do anything without Mehi's approval. Recognizing the threat that Mehi was to her power, Iput attempted to weaken his influence on the pharaoh by arranging a move to a new royal palace where the palace guard would be less of an imposing presence on their rule. However, when Mehi caught wind of this plan, he was outraged at the blatant attempt to undermine his authority and arranged for Teti's assassination. He quickly found many allies for his plot, largely the same bureaucrats who had opposed Teti's ascension in the first place. Teti and Iput, in what was considered the most dignified way to die by the Egyptians, was strangled to death by their own guards ending the life of the founder of Egypt's sixth dynasty. He had ruled for just 13 years. Mehi and his allies went through great effort to make this palace coup look like a legitimate transition of power. They finished Teddy's pyramid, conducted all of the proper funeral rites, 
and went through all the motions that would happen if a king had naturally died. But, everyone in the royal government knew exactly what was going on. Mehi placed Usarkara, a distant relative of Unas, onto the throne, in the hopes that he would be an easier to control puppet. Now, I'd like to pause for a minute so we can reflect on everything that just happened. The pharaoh, once an untouchable person, a living god, was assassinated. Remember, just last episode, I told you that just touching the pharaoh was a criminal practice that could be met with execution. Now think about that for a minute. A pharaoh, once someone who you could be killed just for touching, was assassinated on the throne and replaced with a usurper. Think of just how incalculable of a blow to the prestige of the royal family this must have been. Uzurkara's reign immediately faced opposition from the remaining family of Teti, as well as from the majority of the royal bureaucracy. Few within the Egyptian bureaucracy wanted to be associated with the reign of such an obvious usurper. When Uzurkara died after only a year in power, the throne was quickly given back to Teti's son, Pepi, with the support of the majority of royal bureaucrats. Mehi, sensing that his plot had backfired terribly, tried to downplay his involvement in the plot to assassinate Teti, but to no avail. He and his allies in the coup were executed, and their names erased from royal monuments in an effort to damn their memory. Teti and Usarkara's so-called reigns each left very little impact on Egypt itself, except that they both vastly undermined the authority of the pharaoh. While what little power the royal government had left was managed mostly by the army of bureaucrats in the royal palace. Pepi, or as he's more commonly known, Pepi I, took the throne at an incredibly young age. Throughout his reign, Pepi tried to distance himself from the lineage of his weak father, and instead sought to associate himself with his mother's fifth dynasty heritage. He largely neglected the upkeep of his father's tomb, while working extensively to upgrade and maintain his mother's. Pepi was aware of the process of decentralization that was occurring throughout Egypt, and was proactive in his attempts to reverse this trend. His first problem revolved around taxation. Decades of rule by weak kings, followed by an empty throne, puppet king, and illegitimate usurper, had given many landowners and nomarchs the impression that royal taxes were optional. Pepi decided to reorganize the Egyptian tax system through the conversion of royally owned farmland into what is called a hout. These houts were administrative centers through which the local landlords had to register their yields before selling them to the market, which made the enforcement of taxation on these landowners much easier. He also created a system of rotation within the bureaucracy, in which regional bureaucrats were often recalled from their post and relocated to a new province, seemingly at random. This system ensured that bureaucrats didn't have the time to set up a local base of power within their area of authority. Finally, he fired many of his royal advisors, and gave their positions to two of his most trusted wives in their stead. With the royal coffers once more being replenished and the runaway bureaucracy under control, Pepi began a series of something that Egypt hadn't seen in a long time, royal building projects. Temples, canals, and even a revamping of the national military were the foremost items on his agenda. He even ordered a military expedition into Nubia and Canaan to restart the collection of tribute a process which had been paused during Egypt's civil conflicts. For the first time in almost a century, things were actually looking up for Egypt. However, this optimism wouldn't last long. Pepi's reforms, while effective, were not necessarily popular among the bureaucratic and landowning classes. If you're a bureaucrat, this guy is making you pack your things every so often and move you into an entirely new location for no apparent reason. If you're a landowner, this jerk is making you actually pay your taxes. So, a conspiracy was hatched with one of Pepi's consorts. Angered that Pepi had passed over her son while considering who his heir would be, a plot was hatched to assassinate the king, let a powerful nomarch serve as regent, and then place her son on the throne. It was the perfect plan, except that it was immediately picked up by royal spies, and the plotters were executed. Only a few years later, another, separate plot against him was discovered, this time led by a powerful official named Rawr, the overseer of Upper Egypt. When Pepi heard about this second plot, it confirmed to him that even in times of relative strength, the transition of power after his death would not be easy. To deal with this threat, he came up with an interesting plan. He appointed his son as co-ruler. Thus, when he died, his son would already be in a position of power, and would therefore be harder to overthrow. This plan worked. 
and when Pepe died, power passed to his son, Marin Ra, without any threats. Pepe was buried at Saqqara, in one of the few pyramids from this era to actually be completed. He ruled for an astounding 50 years. Marin Ra enjoyed a brief, yet productive rule. He continued most of the policies of his father, centralizing all of the control of Upper Egypt under one vizier in an effort to continue the re-establishment of royal authority. He also led Egypt's first true military conquest past El Fantine, conquering vast swathes of farmland in northern Nubia. However, for unknown reasons, he died relatively soon into his time as pharaoh. He was buried at an incomplete pyramid in Saqqara, after ruling for a brief, yet productive nine years. Meren Ra was by all account a successful ruler, but his early death is one of the most disastrous events in Egyptian history. While 59 years of strong and stable rule had managed to stabilize the rapidly collapsing old kingdom, it was mostly a facade. The taxation system had been fixed, but the treasury was still recovering from years of misuse. Meren Ra and Pepe's invasions of Canaan and Nubia proved effective, but also costly. And most importantly, they left in their wake a series of weakened, but very annoyed landlords and officials who were very happy to see them gone. The tragedy is that, with maybe just one more effective ruler like these two, the old kingdom may have survived, and made this brief renaissance more permanent. But instead, the worst case scenario occurred. You see, when Marinra died, he left behind only one son, a six-year-old boy named Pepe II. Young Pepe II, who I'll be calling by his Horus name, Neferkara, to avoid confusion, lived a privileged life within the royal palace. His childhood was experienced largely under the protective watch of his mother, who was also his grandmother, and likely also his great-aunt, because this is ancient Egypt, so of course she was. He was showered with expensive toys made of imported ivory and ebony wood, and was even given a captured pygmy man from Nubia, who would serve as sort of a hybrid nanny and jester. However, while Neferkara was enjoying this happy and quiet childhood, Egypt rapidly reverted into its old state of chaos. With no true pharaoh around to resolve conflicts, nomarchs began openly waging war against each other again. The just recently subdued Nubians, Libyans, and Canaanites all simultaneously ceased payment of tribute, and even the payment of taxes from local landowners ceased altogether. When Neferkara finally came of age, he put down his toys and stopped playing with his jester, and was told that he would have to take command of his kingdom. First, he had to stop the countless wars occurring between nomarchs within his borders. He also needed to reinstate the tax system, and also making sure that tribute would begin trickling in from Egypt's neighbors again. He had to manage all this with a bankrupt state, and not knowing which advisors you could trust. You really have to feel for the kid. Now, I should point out that the early stages of Neferkara's reign seem like a positive omen. Under his rule, the conflicts between nomarchs declined, and a brief period of stability ensued. He appointed two separate viziers, one of Upper and one of Lower Egypt, in an attempt to make these regions easier to govern and further enforce the pharaoh's will on the increasingly wealthy nomarchs. But while this strategy was initially successful, factors outside of the control of the government conspired to ensure that Neferkara's reign would not restore Egyptian glory. In a global climate shift known as the 4.2 Kilo Year Event, a decline in global temperatures caused a massive change in weather patterns throughout the world. A drought occurred in the Ethiopian highlands, drastically reducing the amount of water flowing into the Nile River. The Nile's floods were quelled, and Egypt's agricultural output plummeted. In the land where prosperity once ruled, it was famine who now reigned. Neferkara's government proved unable to respond to the famine, as the royal grain stores quickly emptied. In a last-ditch effort to secure food for his people, Neferkara ordered several raids into Libya and Nubia to collect tribute in the form of cattle and grain, only to find that these lands were just as impoverished and starved as his. With grain yields low, peasants and landowners could no longer afford to pay taxes even if they wanted to, and the royal treasury ran dry. Now bankrupt and defeated, the royal government could barely afford to fund its own existence. Necessary advisors, bureaucrats, and servants were fired. The sleepwalking royal government, unable to really do anything, trudged on though, continuing to fulfill its ceremonial duties. Neferkara ruled Egypt for an incredibly long time, the longest rule of any Old Kingdom pharaoh, an incredible 62 years. 
By the end of his rule, Nefercara was a barely conscious, likely geriatric, incredibly ill old man on the brink of death, a mirror image of the kingdom he ruled. This sad state was also reflected in the pyramid in which he would eventually be buried. The masonry was very inconsistent, the limestone shell was of poor quality, and the monument collapsed soon after its construction. Even the funeral arrangements were arranged sloppily, likely rushed by an undermanned, underpaid crew. This would be the last royal pyramid built in Egypt for the next 500 years. Nefercara was the third to last ruler of the Old Kingdom. But, while Nefercara was not technically the last king of the Old Kingdom of Egypt, in a sense he was. He was the last king of this time to truly exercise any sort of earthly power beyond his personal prestige. He was the last king to collect taxes, wage war, or commission major works of architecture. When Nefercara died, the Old Kingdom technically remained, but the Old Kingdom that we've come to know, the kingdom that subjugated its neighbors, commissioned great statues, and constructed everlasting monuments, died with him. Nefercara's long life also proved to be something of a curse, as his son, Merenra II, was already an old man by the time his father died. For this reason, Merenra II's reign was short and uneventful, and he died little more than a year after taking the throne. This short and inactive reign gave Merenra II little time to achieve anything, and his quick death further delegitimized the prestige of the pharaoh. He was the second to last ruler of the Old Kingdom. And, at long last, we can put this dying country out of its misery. The last pharaoh of the Old Kingdom, a man named Netrakara Sipta, took the throne in 2184 BC. Now, I wish this story could conclude in a way that feels appropriate for the end of such a magnificent civilization. I wish it ended with Netjerkara riding valiantly into battle against an invading horde, or with a desperate set of reforms and a last-ditch attempt to save the kingdom from its internal destruction, or even with an exciting yet damaging palace coup to finally put a nail in the old kingdom's sarcophagus. But that would be a lie. The Old Kingdom didn't end in a means deserving of a Hollywood superstar at the end of a blockbuster. Instead, it died in a way that most people will. That me, and you, the person listening to this, most likely will as well. It died slowly, painfully, fighting a losing battle to stay alive against an internal illness. In this way, the Old Kingdom is kinda relatable, you know? Just like a human, it outlived its lifespan and came to an end. By this point in our story, the Old Kingdom is proverbially comatose. Its royal state is non-functional. The pharaoh is a mere figurehead, and its bureaucratic institutions are paralyzed from bankruptcy. But the heart is still beating, still desperately trying to serve as an engine to keep the body running. So we can't legally declare the Old Kingdom dead yet. Netjerkara is still doing royal ceremonies, and he still wears the crown of the two lands above his head and he is still venerated as a living god. But, one day in 2181 BC, just three years into his rule, Netjerkara dies, and with him, the Old Kingdom dies too. Next week, we'll look back on what we learned from the demise of the Old Kingdom, and look forward to what lies in Egypt's future after such a tremendous collapse. Thank you for listening.